Biden ahead of his face to face with Vladimir Putin, how he's preparing for that high stakes summit and the warning he's sending to his Russian counterpart before they meet. Plus, it was a milestone morning here in mm. 1A. The queen of 30 Rock, Tina Fey, stopped by in person. Like, really, she was here. Our first in-studio guest in oh, 455 so days. And you don't want to miss the fun we had chatting about her great Peacock show. Girls forever. Okay. And so much more. You, you want to join that group? I so, so want to be in girl band. And our friend Craig Melvin's new book is out. It's called Pops. It's a real personal story. And to celebrate its release, he got together with Alan Carson to talk about fatherhood and talk about their dads. It's a conversation you don't want to miss. So should we get it all started? Let's go. All right. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. We do begin with President Biden gearing up and preparing for his showdown with Vladimir Putin with one final day of meetings in Brussels. NBC's chief White House correspondent Peter Alexander is traveling with the president. Peter, good morning. Hey, Hoda, good morning to you. President Biden today wrapping up his meetings with America's European allies, saying that those relationships are rock solid ahead of that high stakes summit with Vladimir Putin tomorrow. And despite some criticism that the president is rewarding Putin by giving him this meeting, President Biden says that most of the allies he's met with here have thanked him for it. Also this morning, we're learning new details about where this summit will take place, a historic estate overlooking Switzerland's Lake Geneva. Ahead of tomorrow's crucial summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin, today President Biden's meeting with leaders of the European Union, tackling a series of thorny challenges facing its allies from the coronavirus to trade disputes and new challenges posed by a rising China. But the president's biggest focus, that face-to-face -face with Putin. If he chooses not to cooperate and acts in a way that he has in the past relative to cybersecurity and some other activities, then we will respond. The White House says the president will confront Russia on its election interference in the U.S. and Europe and the recent surge in ransomware attacks on the U.S. food and gas supply that the U.S. blames on Russian hackers. In NBC News's World Exclusive with Putin, he denied Russia was behind those attacks. Mr. Pres president, are you waging a cyber war against America? No, 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 Where is the evidence? Where is proof? It's becoming farcical. The U.S. intelligence community has produced evidence of Russian hackers targeting the federal government and meddling in elections. And some Republicans argue President Biden is not being tough enough on Putin. He said a lot of things, but has, we haven't seen a lot of action. He's not going into this summit and this particular meeting with Putin uh, from a, 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 a position of strength. Mr. Biden saying he's ready to confront Putin tomorrow. He's bright, he's tough, and uh, I have found that uh, he is a, uh, as they say, when he used to play ball, a worthy adversary. And we're learning more details this morning, Peter, on how the president is preparing for this meeting. So I. Yes, Savannah, that's exactly right. I'm told days before departing the U.S. for Europe, President Biden huddled in the Roosevelt Room at the White House with about 10 experts on Russia from outside of the White House, including some who formerly worked for former President Trump. This lasted for two hours this session, where they discussed a range of views, I'm told, about how to deal with Vladimir Putin from those who have interacted with him in the past. Remember, President Biden has only met with Putin once before, one person telling me of the president. He is not winging it. He's putting a lot of time and attention into this meeting. Savannah. Peter Alexander, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking nice. Yeah. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. 
spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Hey guys, guys, wait a second. What? Look outside. You hear a horn out there? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are we looking at? People, that's <laughs> a double decker, decker bus. Yeah. Yeah. They're always look out there. on. Wait, I know, but is look on group? top. Who is that? It's not a group. Hello, uh, one hey. It is Tina. I'm coming in. One A is open. <laughs> Woo! Tina, we're open. What a sight. Hello, Tina. What Hi, a Tina. sight for sore eyes. Watch out for that traffic light. I'm coming to see you. <laughs> we're waiting. We are waiting for no you. No one is driving this bus. <laughs> <laughs> Tina is our first guest in Studio I'm 1A in 455 wow. long days. You know, when we at the Today Show get excited about something, we go big. Yeah. We're going huge. It Tina. makes sense. She's the queen of 30 Rock. Yeah. It's Tina. perfect first guest. Hello. Tina, we've got a red Hello. carpet waiting for you. Oh my gosh. I cannot wait, Hoda. All right, I let's cannot get, wait. Giddy up, get off that bus and come in here and hang out with us. Studio 1A. Okay. Come down the red carpet, Tina. Tina. Bay. Let's go, Tina. Yes. Just whatever you like. Wait. Stretch it out. It's your can moment. Can we do something that we haven't done in a long time? Hug someone. We can? Oh my gosh. Wait I just have a slight head cold, but don't oh, worry. Stop. I would welcome a head cold. I, guys, I am so honored to be here. I don't know how I got to be this person, but <laughs> I, I want to thank all of you guys for keeping all of us outside 1A, oh. like tethered to, to reality oh. for the last year and a half. Every milestone that you guys, when you guys came back together, these were such like uplifting moments of optimism for the rest of us. So thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. That's so oh sweet. God. Were we on your pandemic bucket list after it was over to come? Yes, yes, <laughs> 100%. Well, you were on ours. Yes. I mean, we, there's so much to talk to you about, but mm -hmm. let's, because we actually celebrated your 50th birthday we together on Zoom. Yes, I remember, mm -hmm. and you guys gave me um, golden double-stuffed Oreos. <laughs> I know, we're good like that. I mean, but now you have a big entrance. It's even better. What is the, I mean, what's the last year been like for you? Mm -hmm. What does it feel like is to get back to normal? Yeah, it feels great to be. It feels great to be here. Um, you know, we were lucky enough that we were able to work. NBC Universal took really good care of us and our mm -hmm. crew, and and so we were able to make Girls Five Eva and to make finish the season of Mr. Mayor during the mm -hmm. pandemic. And it is, you know, um, to be able to be around other people and and make things has been a a, a great blessing for all. I of think. Us. I mean, this show made. It, we feel like it's like the Ted Lasso for girls. Like yes. it's so much fun to watch. We loved it. But I was just thinking, you you created this thing during the pandemic. Yeah. Now you've got Emmy buzz. Now you're renewed for, for season, season two. two. Yes. Yes. Yesterday, yesterday morning, yes, Girls 5 Eva will be back for season two. Yes. So all the more reason to check out season one on Peacock now. Um, my friend Meredith Scardino is the creator oh, of the show, and she is just gosh. one of the funniest people Did you ever. know, like, did you think we got, this, this is gold right here. We have something going. Yeah, I knew that Meredith was a joke machine. Yeah. <laughs> and then once we were able to get this cast, Sarah Bareilles and Renee Elise Goldsberry, mm -hmm. Busy Phillips, Paula Pell. Once I, I just you you feel like you know when something is very yeah. juicy. Well, the cast is so magical. I mean, they really mix. And I mean, I get, it's it's the music, it's the funny writing, it's all of it yeah. together. But I mean, you have folks like Sarah Bareilles that she was super nervous because yeah. She's a great singer. She hadn't really thought about being an actress or a comedic actress. Yes, I had seen Sarah in Waitress on Broadway, um, and sh I was like, oh, she's a wonderful actress. And I had seen her be really funny hosting the Tony Awards and yeah. stuff. And I was like, I think, and also I just really like casting. I like finding people. And, and, um, and so once we got her... And she's fantastic. She's an absolute natural. Well, the music is the other star of the show. I'm sorry. Those songs. Oh. I was literally almost peeing my pants listening to some of them. Who came up with all those songs? Um, thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, the music is, you know, um, the... My husband, Jeff Richmond, yes. has been... Writes pretty much all the music for the show, with the exception of, like, yeah. a song. And... Um, and Meredith Scardino, she, I would say, wrote the bulk of the lyrics along with the, the writers of the show. Can we play the Tiny Butt song? Please. It's so funny. Hold it's on. So I think we good. have a teeny clip. 
a tiny clip tiny with clip. tiny butts. You're part of Girls 5 Ever, right? Yeah. I remember you. You had that song on the soundtrack of Blue Crush. Oh, yeah, TBF. TBF, tiny butts forever, to silver dollar, pancakes and jeans. This will be what people act like forever. TBF, tiny butts and jeans. <laughs> Tiny but butts and jeans. jeans. I mean, right on. I think Meredith is great at nailing those kind of jokes <laughs> where it's calling out like things from the 90s where you're like, yeah. that's crazy. And the idea that, yeah, like we're going to like tiny butts forever. And then Jeff <laughs> makes the songs sound really good and the women sing really well. So you have the earworm plus the yeah. That's the kind of the humor of it. It's yeah. like it actually sounds really good. And then you listen to the words and you're like, that is ridiculous. Wait, you know what I was just thinking in the second? What if we had like a Girls 5 Eva Today Show Concert. concert. Let's do it today. Yeah, but could we? I Outside. Mean, we have a summer concert series. I, Would, yes. Could you imagine? The, I, by the way, those it. girls can sing off the hook together. That yeah, harmony is they great. They sound great together. There's another rising what? star in the show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Her name is Penelope Richmond. Yes. Do you know her? I do <laughs> know her. I, I live with her. Um, you gave birth to her. I gave birth to her, <laughs> and I will be cooking her vegetarian chicken nuggets later. Um, yeah, she, our daughter, uh, Penelope, ended up being in the show. There was a part for a nine-year-old. And I was like, if we don't let her audition for this, she's going to kill us. But and you didn't give her the part. No. Well, we, she auditioned. She put herself on tape. And then, you know, uh, Meredith was like, should we give her the part? And I was like, no, you can't. I can't let, you know, the boss's kid get the mm -hmm. first job they ever auditioned for. But she's like, but she did really well. So we ended up, we hired another kid. And then because of the pandemic, the kid was out of state and couldn't come in. And oh. I was like, Penelope, you're up. And, and she did a great job and she was super <laughs> professional and, you know, um, at a, at a, for like a kind of a grim year of like distance learning, and all that stuff. It was a little treat for her. It is funny when you have your first kid, you're like, oh, absolutely not. You're so strict. And yeah. then your second kid, you're like, what do you want? Do yeah, exactly. do you want to get a tattoo? So, Let's do it. Exactly. Wait, were you super nervous, too? I, you know, I know the whole crew forever. Yeah. It's like the crew has been with us yeah. since 30 Rock. And so I, I felt like no matter what, it would be okay. But I was very, very proud of her because, you know, it's one of those moments where you're like, oh, there's, oh, you brought all your manners today. Oh. Like, that's the main thing, right, as a, as a, a parent, and I'm like, yeah. oh, your manners were lovely. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Please don't pick your nose. That's yeah. all we're asking. No, she would never. Now, there's a cameo mm -hmm. from one Carson Daly, but yes. it's a vocal cameo. Yes. How yes. did this come about? I've been trying to slow play Carson onto the show. Now that we know there's a season two, don't think I won't be back, Carson. Let's go. Um, so we, it was, again, it was the middle of the pandemic. Uh -huh. We didn't want to bother you too much. We, at first, we were casting a lookalike because we have these flashbacks to old music videos and old TRL, and it was cracking me up because we were trying to cast a Carson Daly look-alike, sound-alike. Mm -hmm. And my husband was like, every guy, we were like, what about this guy? And he was like, no, Carson has piercing blue eyes. <laughs> and I was like, all right, buddy. <laughs> like, but I think it's because he has blue eyes, too, and he thinks he knows they're, like, the most valuable weapon. Um, and so we ended up um, getting Carson, begging Carson to, to voice over. Because, so, honestly, Carson, you're iconic. And, like, yes. it, oh, it, it, it doesn't work. If it's I wanted iconic. to do it in person, actually, but with the pandemic, it was, like, impossible it was to do madness. it. Like, you I think, think you were doing the, the voice. Yeah. But that's why we've got season two. Season two. All right, let's talk about your other show, yeah. Mr. Mayor. I'm going to yes. roll a clip and then let's talk about it. Okay, great. Hey, Tommy, how much do we spend to take care of the city's palm tree? Oh, uh, $50 million a year, sir. 50? You have any idea how many miles of bus lane I could buy with that? A bunch, I'll bet. Sir, I have been trying to call attention to this topic for years. Palm trees are not even supposed to be here. Most of them were planted for the 1932 Olympics to trick people into thinking LA wasn't a waterless scorpion graveyard. So palm trees are expensive, dangerous, and they shouldn't be here in the first place. Like an NFL franchise, sir. <laughs> Holly Hunter, yes. Ted Danson, yes. this is incredible, and you're writing season two right now. Yeah, we're writing season two right now. Season one, also available mm -hmm. on Peacock, though, if you want to check it out. Um, and it's, yeah, Ted Danson, Holly Hunter, Vela Lavelle, Mike Cavallon, and our own beloved Bobby Moynihan hand from SNL and they are cast. just also a dream cast. Well, Tina, thank for. you. Stick around because there's much more coming up on Today in 30.
Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines, but change that allowed this new recommendation to be made. If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey, reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, today in 30, you're about to see my interview with one of my new favorite moms, Lynn manuel Miranda's mom. Now, because you're special, one thing you won't see, can I tell you, back when Lynn was younger, he made a pact with his mom that he would one day win an Oscar. And it was the time when Whippy Goldberg actually hosted the awards and she looked at the audience and she said, you at home, you could be here too. They made a pact and you know what? It actually happened. Are we ready to see the spot now, Al? Yes, let's All right, roll it. What was it like then to sit in the theater when you know that it was, you know, Lynn's baby, if you will, and then to see it all come together? What does that feel like as a mom? A dream come true, and it was just amazing how it came together. And my husband was instrumental in making that happen. He was hugely supportive once he was on board. How important is that? It always worries me when I see uh, children being torn down by their parents. My thought is always, if your own parents can't really build you up and support you and acknowledge what an amazing individual you are, who's gonna do it? So take me back to those early days. So you were a working mom, your husband was working. You know, how did you do it? So we both worked at any given time, as my son, you'll hear him say often. I have I never known when my parents didn't have more than one job. I'm very fortunate in that Luis and I really tag team and share depending on what was on our plates at any given time one or the other of us would assume a more uh, responsibility. You know, I also think it's been really important that Lynn has been very open about the fact that he struggled with anxiety as a kid. And I know he's talked about the fact that there was a childhood friend who tragically passed away and that affected him deeply. Uh, did you see that as a mom and how did you support him? Every night I would tuck him into bed and I would ask him what was the best thing that happened in school, what was the worst thing that happened in school, and depending on how he was feeling and if he was having any difficulty falling asleep, I would talk him through some relaxation exercises and breathing exercises to get him to sleep. So I basically tucked him into bed every night, despite having worked all those jobs. That was one thing I never missed with either of my children. Clearly music is, is, is innate, it's in your family. Talk about your love of music and your husband too. Right, well, my husband and I both loved soundtracks. So as the children were growing up, we played our favorite records, whether or not we had seen, like I never saw Camelot, but I loved the score. And one of the cardinal rules in our house is our children don't leave until they know how to dance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I saw this video of Lynn, I don't know when it was, and he was dancing. Yes, since we were busy often, he basically was uh, free to create whatever he wanted. And he was constantly using a video machine or a tape recorder. And he made up a Cabbage Patch uh, song to it. The Cabbage Patch Pids are, and I forget the <laughs> lyrics, but he basically uh, started composing just you know, off the head from the time he was very tiny. 
Let me ask you about Hamilton. Uh, when you first heard the idea, what were your initial thoughts? I have to tell you, the first time I saw a run through of it, I was so bereft by the end of the play that I couldn't speak for half an hour. He had done such an amazing job that he, it broke my heart that Alexander Hamilton had died young. <laughs> Do you ever have moments of awe? My first huge moment of awe was when he got the MacArthur Genius Award. <laughs> <laughs> and they've only continued since then. But bringing Hamilton to the White House is very special. One last time. And having them sing one last time in front of the Obamas in their last year was just incredibly moving. What would you say to the mom or dad or parent aunt, uncle, grandmother, whoever is raising a child, when they feel like they're in the thick of it and things are so busy um, that they may feel like it's spinning out of control, but they love hard and they're as present as they can be. What would you say? Well, I, I often told families struggling with children's issues since I'm a psychologist, you gotta do the best you can now because if you don't, they won't grow up and leave you. You will stay with you. <laughs> You have to support them because the goal is to get them to be able to be independent, fulfilled adults. Oh. So this is just a snippet of a much longer conversation, yeah. but I, she is so fascinating. And we were just talking off camera. You see how early sometimes talent can start mm -hmm. to yeah. bloom. And he's dancing by himself oh and gosh. writing musicals. And now we have Hamilton yeah. and, and, and then the Heights and what have you. So I'm hoping, you know, that this is something that we can all watch it as parents and say, you know what? Mm -hmm. Let's kind of pour into our children. I should yep. mention, um, you know, yesterday, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda addressed some criticism of his new movie in the Heights right. um, by those who say there wasn't enough Afro-Latino representation. And he owned up to it. You know, he said he's listening. He's promising to do better uh, in the future. And I have to say, I've, I've watched all of this. And after talking with his mom, and there's a part um, well, you'll see in the full interview about how thoughtful he is. He takes these conversations to heart, like by responding, you know what, I'm listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Trust me, there will be more conversations um, in the months and, and, and weeks ahead. So if you want to hear the longer conversation, it is worth it. Just go to today.com. She has a lot to share. That's enjoyed really that. cool. Yeah, yeah. I really yeah, enjoyed that. that. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all gonna get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, tap it. Oh. So grateful. Is that close to crying? Here we go. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. As we've been telling you, this is a big and important morning for our dear friend Craig. A deeply personal new book that he's written, Pops, is out today. Yeah, as you guys know, I've been holding on to this story for a long time about my father's struggles, but ultimately his resiliency. So in honor of the book, I invited two of the best dads I know, Alan Carson, out to the house to have a, a candid chat about all things fatherhood. As an anchor and correspondent, I've delivered the news from studio, chased stories across the globe. But today, today I'm sharing my own story. I think the average person, when they think of Craig Melvin, they just, they think this is a guy that's never had a bad day in his life. This is a guy with like a star wattage smile beautiful family, success. What has the reaction been from, from people who thought that they knew you and didn't realize you have this story to tell? Um, I, I think the reaction is akin to what you just said. I don't think there are a lot of people that really know me. And that's not a good thing, probably. 
That story in my new book, Pops, is about my father's battle with addiction and how it affected our family. My dad, Lawrence, worked the overnight shift at the post office, and when he wasn't working, he drank. This went on for decades. In 2018, we staged an intervention, and my father went to rehab. I'll never forget my first visit there. Uh, I see my dad, and he gives me this big hug. And we're not big huggers. Right. We're not a hugging family. It's like, oh, dad's hugging. And he gives me this hug, and I'm crying. He's crying. He gives me this, this letter that he's written. 40 years, my dad's never written me a letter, but he's written me this letter. And we sat, and we had breakfast, and it was just, like, it's one of those, like, I know on my deathbed, I'll remember that day. And in that moment, like, I knew, I knew it had worked. The book wasn't something I wanted to write. It's more like I needed to write it. What does it feel like? to get it, it's out there now, I'm, people are reading about I'm, it. I've never been more nervous or frightened or scared or anxious. Don't you feel relieved? It. No. That's not a I thing? don't think I do relief. Wow. Um, I was relieved, scratch that, I was relieved when my dad read it. Right. And, and my dad signed off on it. And I was like, okay. Halfway through, I realized I wasn't writing this book for like strangers. I was writing it for me, I wrote it for my dad, I wrote it for my kids. Our family's story is one of struggle, but also faith and resilience. We never quit on my dad, and now he's an engaged father and quite the doting grandfather. I can remember it was dinner time when we were growing up. It's important for dads to get together and compare notes. I'm lucky to count two great fathers from work among my friends. We all come from different upbringings and are all trying to be the best fathers we can be. I think good fathers don't come in the same size packaging yep. that we all grew up yep. thinking it did. But in the overall grand scheme of our lives and what we think of our fathers, yeah. better late than never is as good as anything you're gonna get. I was really fortunate. My dad, I really look at it, my dad was more the nurturer than my mother was. Really? Mm. My mother was tough. I mean, loving, you know. Yeah. My dad was again, a hugger, yeah. a kisser. I didn't know that men weren't supposed to kiss until I'd go to some family reunions, wow. you know, and I'd go to I remember my Uncle Champ. Hey, Uncle Champ. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, 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 how you doing? <laughs> Meanwhile, but, we hug and kiss. I mean, I, of course, you're probably the same way. I know you are. Hug and kiss the kids all the time. Every second I get. Yeah. All the time. Every second. Coming up to this Father's Day, how is it different? I've developed more of an appreciation for everything than I had before the pandemic, especially like being a father. Because we got, we all got more time with our kids right. over the past year. I felt guilty I loved it so much. Yeah. Because people were out of work, people were mm -hmm. dying. Yes. But it, I was like, oh, I sort of love this. I get my kids yes. all day, all day. We all agree that time slips by too fast. In the period of two weeks, I had a daughter graduate mm -hmm. from college and another one get married. And, and it's a cliche, but it goes by like that. Right. I mean, literally, Courtney was in middle school. Yesterday. And then it was high school right. yesterday. And right. then, boom, she's now a married woman. My middle girl is a college graduate. Nick's going to be a senior in high right. school this fall. You're going to be an empty nester. I'm going to be When an we do this right. next year, right. you'll be right. an empty nester. Absolutely. An empty nester. And right. I'm sad about it. I mean, as much as, you know, I think. Come over to my house uh, and watch uh, my kids. I, 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 I'd love to. I would love. They would put it up, you know. Bring, bring them over to Uncle Al. A couple years from now, we're doing this. Be Grandpa Al. Oh yeah, and and if that there, might happen sooner than I mean, that. If, and if there's a kid who's like lucky to have a grand, oh gosh, the, the Al Roker grandson or granddaughter or both. Yep. My God. Well, that's the greatest revenge on your kid. <laughs> yep. Is that anything that Any rules I'm going to do? Break everything. Hey, here's a five-pound bag of Domino sugar <laughs> and a big spoon. Go nuts. By it's... the way, I've just noticed mm -hmm. sitting here, I've never seen. it. You've got gray at your temples. You shut the hell up. You've got gray at your, you at least you got temples. No, no, I, I, got, know, but, I do have gray. It's but, happened. Yeah. I, it's yeah. funny, it. like in the Welcome last year. It. No, it's happened in the last year. Thank you, Al. Welcome to it. Thank you. <laughs> this is over. We're done. You can wash that cut gray tape. right out, too. <laughs> oh, so I'm looking good, for guys. gray. Yeah, well, I try to cut it up before we <laughs> come on air, but of course, Roker noticed it. Of course, of course he, does. he does. And in the, in the moment, mind you, it's like, is that gray? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I will tell you that it, you're going to help a lot of people mm -hmm. with this book. It's going to, uh, uh, I think, start a lot of conversations. It's the and, and I'm just really proud of you. Big show tomorrow on Today in 30, including an exclusive performance from Bruce Springsteen and the Killers. Can you believe How that? How good is that? It's going to be great. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow right here on Today.
Welcome to Today All Day. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be sharing some of my favorite interviews with you. These conversations include lessons from dads across the country, inspiring stories of hope, and a few laughs along the way as well. So sit tight, get ready for more. Today All Day, right now. I used to fish by a pond like this one when I was a boy in Vietnam. Minneapolis-based writer and poet Bao Phi was just a four-month-old baby when his family fled their home country for the United States during the Vietnam War. What did they tell you about that time? It was chaos. Um, the other side was shelling the airport, trying to kill as many of us as possible as we tried to flee. Although his parents told him stories of that time, he never fully internalized what it meant to be a survivor of war until it was his turn to become a dad. We went to uh, see the doctor and they give you a, a questionnaire. One of the questions was, have anyone in your family or your family line survived war? It was like a switch that had been flipped um, that I was like, yes. In fact, it, it was me being a survivor of war actually had an effect on who I was and could have an effect on my child. After his child's song was born in 2009, Bao realized that Asian Americans and other immigrant families like his were not being represented in children's books. I just really wanted something for my kid to connect my kid to their grandparents, my parents, you know, and that's really why I wrote my first children's book. Bao's first book, A Different Pond, received the Caldecott honor in 2018. Centered on a father-son fishing trip, the book is about hardworking refugee parents scrambling to create a better life for their children. And now you have a, a new book out. It's called Hello Mandarin Duck. And there are 18 different languages used in the book. What was the thinking there? Part of it is a love letter to my neighborhood and my community. I remember being a refugee from Vietnam and being among the first, you know, large, visible Asian populations to come to Minnesota. Some people were, were very welcoming and some people very much were not. For me now, raising a child in this environment, I just think that that message of kindness and inclusivity is so important for all of our kids. I think that that's gonna make all of us stronger. Hello Mandarin Duck tells the story of two young children who spot a lost duck on their way to a May Day parade celebration. Along with a diverse group of friends, they help the duck find its way back to the pond. There's this moment in the book where the police arrive and things, they get a little hairy. Why was it important to include that, that element? George Floyd was murdered three blocks away from where my child went to preschool and summer school. My child has expressed these fears that their grandmother will be deported for whatever reason. For some of us, authority, for one reason or another, is a scary thing rather than a comfort. I feel somewhat responsible for having some of those moments in my children's books. As I was reading the book, I thought, this, this guy is trying to, to help rear an entire generation of woke kids. Yes, like, let's make it normal for kids to stand up against injustice and for what's right. Let's make it normal for kids to envision a better world for all of us. What are some of the examples of, uh, of, of life advice, of wisdom that you share with some of these young men? It's not how you start, it's how you finish, I think is the most simple jewel you can give a person. Keith A. Lewis Jr. and Jermaine Clark didn't know much about running a nonprofit when they first started offering free haircuts to kids in their neighborhood. But pretty soon, the organization they started, I'm a Father First, had taken on a life of its own. How did the organization come to be? Going through a divorce. You know, at a young age, I went from just being a young man trying to raise uh, two kids to now being a divorced father, having to drive five hours to and from to have a connection. That not being there to wake my children up every morning was the most painful thing I can go through. And it made me just have to repeat the affirmation, I'm a father first. Using their former work experience in branding, the pair created T-shirts with the motto, I'm a father first. 
Soon after, they teamed up with Atlanta Public Schools to start a program to provide free haircuts and mentoring to local boys, many from fatherless homes. Because I was uh, your typical knucklehead, I always getting in trouble until they came to the school and told us that that wasn't it, that wasn't the route to go. Demetrius Marshall is an alumni of the I'm a Father First program. He enlisted in the Army after working with Keith and Jermaine throughout high school. A specific lesson that I learned was don't take anything that you have for granted because there's always someone less fortunate. What are some of the examples of, uh, of, of life advice, of wisdom that you share with some of these young men? It's not how you start, it's how you finish, I think, is the most simple jewel you can give a person. So I tell kids, the same young man that can be put out of a school 25 years ago, the same young man that could, you know, get shot twice, which I got shot twice in these city streets, can go back and help. And this past summer after, a group of young men gained a bad reputation for aggressively selling bottled water on the streets of Atlanta, I'm a Father First started an entrepreneur program to teach them business skills, rebranding them with the name The Corner Boys. Why was it that you felt the need to help start this program for them. We just saw how they were too aggressive. So we wanted to come in and I'm good with names. So I came up, well, we're gonna call them the corner boys. You know, that's gonna make all the kids say, what's that, huh? what's that? And then the branding, I mean, we had lime green shirts. So we feed them, we provide the water. I went to prison for selling drugs and I was no good at it. I talked way too much to do that, you know, I'm a marketer. So the same way Corner Boys meant dope seller back in the day, it now means a kid that works with Keith and Jermaine out here selling some water. When the pandemic struck, I'm a father first pivoted to provide free meals to the homes of the boys with whom they'd been working. Partnering with Atlanta Public Schools and corporate sponsors, they started feeding 400 households five days a week. They call the program Meals of Love. Feeding families in Atlanta through uh, through your Meals of Love program. And how'd that come about? I call the principals and the superintendent and get permission to service their children. And then I tap in with the parent liaison to make sure we have the right families who they know are on the brink of one bill not being paid sitting in that house and not having power or food. This is a true grassroots organization. And it all started with I am a father first. Is that is that still is that still your mantra? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the actually the mantra is we are the village. Father first is going to stay there, but it's going to trail off into so many things. Doing God's work, Keith. Nothing but him. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, tap it. So grateful. Is that close to crime? Here we go. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, tap it. So grateful. Is that close to crime? Here we go. Jake Jet Pulse. Dad? Professional comic book artist Led Bradshaw's son Jake was just three and a half years old when he was diagnosed with autism. Help! What did you know about autism? Um, I really didn't know anything. The diagnosis led me to do a lot of, uh, a lot of research. Through that research, Led discovered art therapy exercises that he started incorporating into his son's daily routines. And then one of the, uh, the the projects was envision yourself as a superhero. He started drawing himself as this character, and it was all that he wanted to talk about. 
and it, it would seem as if the apple didn't fall far from the tree because you were quite the comic book kid too. And I guess you could see behind me, it's like I never let that go. I knew what I wanted to do ever since I was little. Like all I wanted to do was draw Saturday morning cartoons. No, Walking Dead and Night of the Living Dead are two different things. Lad and Jake started nerding out over everything comic related they could get their hands on. And they soon found themselves collaborating on their first original <laughs> father-son comic book, Jake Jet Pulse. How did that first Jake Jet Pulse book come to be? Jake was in the second grade and it was a parent-teacher's conference about his ability to remember like sight words and spelling. The whole idea came about when I asked the teacher, I was like, well, can I have a list of the sight words the kids are learning? Out of that list, Led began creating flashcards for his son. On them, he drew pictures of a superhero in Jake's likeness, acting out the vocabulary words. Jake flying, Jake, you know, running real fast. So he learned the words run, jump. So what kind of color hair would he have? He would have blue hair. What's his role now? He's involved in almost every part of it, greeting the characters, envisioning like the backstory. He sits at my side while I'm putting it all together so I get his stamp of approval. Like that? Mm -hmm. There you go. I should hire you. So sometimes they'll say, Dad, that, that's that's actually not, that's that's not my vision. We need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, sometimes like I like to lend my creative input, but I, you know, I just give in. You know, there's no point in <laughs> arguing. <laughs> what has this meant for, for him emotionally, intellectually, being this involved uh, in a project like this? His vocabulary started to build. He became more confident. It's like being a superhero, he started to emulate the, the, the character also. Even though it's a collaborative thing, it's more like a, like a love letter to my son where I can actually teach him how to be a good human being, you know, like, to not give up, to work your hardest, to do your best. In addition to raising awareness about autism through the character of Jake Jet Pulse, Led also created a website to help educate people about autism spectrum disorder and foster a sense of community for parents. As a parent, I wanted to create something to show people that you're not alone. This does not define who their children will be. There are amazing and exceptional individuals who are on the autism spectrum. I wanted to create something that gives people hope. A feeling of hope, strength, and confidence that has surely rubbed off on his son, Jake. Jake, do you have a favorite comic book character? Yes, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too, Jake Jet Pulse. I'm a big fan. Can I ask you about autism? If you're diagnosed with autism, that's not bad. It's okay. You're still unique and you can do anything. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, champion. So grateful. That close to crime. Here we go. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. 
Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Which is harder, respiratory therapist or father of, of three under the age of one? Uh, option B, sir. Option B. <laughs> You got quite the quite the busy house, I would imagine. How are things right now? Wonderful. Everybody's doing great. Um, and like you said, you know, it's pretty busy. Busy is an understatement. Uh, Day Suleiman, a respiratory therapist at Chicago's Northwestern Memorial Hospital, found out his wife was pregnant at the end of 2019. The couple was overjoyed because they've been trying to start a family for the last five years. Take me back. What was that like? We had a pregnancy that we've been fighting for for forever. So we had anticipated a June baby, but then we found out some complications early uh, periods of January that, you know, we had some severe complications that might jeopardize this pregnancy. So my wife, Jennifer, was admitted in the hospital for observation. Somehow, someway, Jaden showed up, said, hey, I'm here. A little too early, a lot too early. The couple's joy was soon tempered by the fear surrounding the premature birth of their son, Jaden, born at just 23 weeks last February, just weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic began. You've got a, a brand new baby uh, who has a, a, a number of health complications. Yes. And at the same time, you're on the front lines of fighting this virus that we knew very little about at that point. Right. How were you just managing the stress of it all? Work and the family were very, very separated at that time. What I'm dealing with outside of the hospital shouldn't really affect how I'm caring for patients at the hospital. But yes, it was not gonna be easy. A day visited his son in the NICU after his own long shifts at the hospital, spent working with patients on life support and putting himself at a very high risk for contracting the virus. Was I afraid and worried about taking the virus over there? Absolutely. but. Um, I still try my best to put every precaution in place, a shower, a change of clothing, and even when I get to the NICU side of things, extra gear just to have some protection to be around him. So we have a, a newborn with some health complications. Yes. We have uh, the start of a, of, of a pandemic. And then we find out we're pregnant again. Yes. Oh, and by the way, it's twins. Yes. So that did happen. Um. <laughs> the twins, Janelle and Jordan, were born December 16th, 2020, just a few months after their firstborn, Jaden, was released from his extended time in the NICU. I was elated. Uh, this was ecstasy. And this was another set of kids that I have to do everything in my power to just protect, to just cherish. Which is harder, respiratory therapist or father of, of three under the age of one? Uh, option B, sir. Option B. <laughs> I mean, I've been around here enough to where I can manage myself. But if two kids are screaming, I'm confused oftentimes. I'm trying to figure out food, diaper, what is going on. Do you have a stomach ache? You're not talking, you're just screaming. Help me out, child. The fact that all of this was going on uh, as a pandemic raged, did, did, that, did that make it maybe even sweeter? For me, yes. Having people not being able to come see their family members in their absolute most critical moments was pretty challenging. And watching people die with no one here for them. So finding out, you know, that there's some exciting thing going on, it puts a smile on my face after every shift. Once I leave here, let me go find out about what's going on on this end of the spectrum where everything looks, you know, a little challenging, but great. This is another rainbow situation for me. So this shows that they have stuff back yet. So when the pandemic hit last spring, Dr. Michael Torre was just six months into his career in emergency medicine, working alongside his father, Dr. Paul Torre, at Houston's Memorial Hermann Hospital. He always kind of uh, seemed interested in, you know, pursuing a career in medicine. I, I never pushed him. I, I never pushed uh, any of my kids. So growing up, he kind of would kind of talk medicine here or there, you know, just high school, college, he would say things. And we had 
did this, did that, and we always thought it was cool. When I started doing emergency medicine, then we could really talk very specific about what's going on, what we're doing, and really, you know, connect about it. But the sweetness of reaching that career goal turned sour as the pandemic surged in the Houston area last summer, filling emergency rooms. Pandemic came six months into his career. There was a lot of fear. Am I, I going to get this stuff and, you know, and then, you know, wind up in a box or is, you know, is it going to happen to my, my family? Pretty much every, almost after every shift, we'll call each other and be like, I did this today. Oh, yeah. Just like, I saw this today. What about you? And I think, I think that helped without really explicitly saying, you know, I need help. The father son team was put to the test on one of their first shifts working together. There's certain things we do. Um, to resuscitate critical people. And we got to work on someone and help them out and you know, do the critical care procedures that we've been trained to do together at the same time. He needed something, I just was handed it to him before he asked for it and vice versa. I needed help doing something and he was just ready right there. Medicine in general is teamwork. And when you're in one place for a while, you know, you know how your team works and this is our first time working together. And it just, it was teamwork like we've been doing it for years. But we have. <laughs> Dr. Justin Reed, a resident physician at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Mishawaka, Indiana, and a father of five, had a busy life before the pandemic hit, but it was nothing compared to what his family has endured this past year. You know, I get home, everything was going directly into the, the washing machine, and then I was going to shower. You know, my kids are waiting for me when I come home, excited to see me, want to jump on me, tell me about their day, but we weren't allowing it. Acknowledging the psychological strain of the pandemic on his team, Justin's supervisor asked him to write a short essay about how he was coping. At a loss for words, Justin decided to make a drawing instead. It's me outside of a, a glass window, kneeling down, reaching out my hand to, to my son. And then in the background, I've got uh, flaming arrows sticking out of me. It just kind of captured the way I was feeling at the time. And, um, and I think the way a lot of us were feeling. Tragedy struck the family in December when Justin's father-in-law and grandfather both contracted COVID-19. His father-in-law suffered a COVID-induced stroke from which he is still recovering, and his grandfather fell victim to the disease. The pair said goodbye to each other via iPads from separate hospital beds. Grandpa couldn't speak because he was on uh, oxygen mask and uh, Father-in-law couldn't speak because of the stroke, and so they just cried, um, and it was a pretty, pretty harrowing, touching experience. Explaining it all to his five kids has been the hardest part of it all. There's been hard moments, but but overall, they just were willing to go with it, and they wore their masks. And even my five-year-old, when we go out and see somebody not wearing a mask or not wearing it properly, will point it out and say. Doesn't that guy know he could catch COVID? With vaccines rolling out across the country and hospitalization rates declining, Justin is planning on making a new drawing to express the hope he's feeling now. But this time, walking through that door and picking up and holding my son with my mask in my hand instead of on my face and with a sticker that says I got vaccinated. That's the feeling that I have now and, and grateful to be on this side of it. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! 
Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Keep going, keep going. Block the shot. Years ago, I used to say, forget about the ponytail and look at them as wrestlers because there's going to be a point where the ponytail is not going to matter. And we're at that point. Team Alpha is an all-girls wrestling club started five seasons ago. We started out with approximately nine girls, since have grown to over 50. An alpha wolf doesn't necessarily have to be an alpha male, right? Female wolf can be the alpha, the leader of the pack. You know, we're not quite leaders just yet on the national scene, but we're getting there. Participation in girls wrestling has seen a 500% increase since 2001 and is currently sanctioned as a high school sport in 21 states. Team Alpha's home state of New York isn't yet one of these, so girls either wrestle on the boys' team or compete in clubs outside of school. I have uh, two daughters, Kendall, who is 13. She's been wrestling just over three years, and McKenna, who is 10, and she's been wrestling a little over five, and she was probably around two or three. And my wife and I noticed that the only time she ever sat still was when she was either watching wrestling on TV with me or at tournaments. After watching one of those wrestling tournaments as a four-year-old, McKenna told her dad something that would change everything. And I was like, Dad, I want to start wrestling. And then I started wrestling on the boys team at first, and then Dad made a girls team. What do you like about wrestling? Since I'm wrestling, I feel like I'm tougher. When you were wrestling with the boys, did you enjoy that? Yeah, it's fun. When you wrestle them, it's not that intense as it is wrestling a girl. Why is that? Because boys um, aren't that tough. I'd probably do better if I wrestled boys, but I kind of like wrestling girls better because girls don't sweat as much as the boys do when we're wrestling. As a boy, I'll pretend not to be offended. Okay. The girls of Team Alpha range in age from kindergarten to 12th grade, but they all see themselves as part of the same movement. I feel like it's like partially like a women's rights movement in a way because we're trying to get like a male dominant sport to also be like our sport. I've had coaches say girls shouldn't be wrestling, like just, you know, we all hear it, but I kind of block it out or just take it as like motivation to just push myself. The other kids in my class, I'm like, call me a tomboy, but I'd rather be a tomboy than a girly girl, so I like it better than that. I know it's 2020, but you know that there are still some people who think girls shouldn't be wrestling. Yeah. It's, it's not a sport for girls. What, what would you say to them? Um, I would say girls can do anything boys can. We just brush it off until they sanction girls wrestling here in New York, then we'll do what we got to do to get the girls on the mat that want to be on the mat. Coach Ken started wrestling in third grade, encouraged by his dad, a former high school wrestler who would work double shifts to support their family. Long days on the job prevented him from attending Ken's wrestling matches. You know, I ran around most of my teens, you know, mad, angry. Why doesn't my dad get to come to all my stuff like some of the other kids? When I started coaching my kids and when they started to get older, I swore I'd never miss anything. So that's what I base everything around. I have to be there. 12, 13, 14. Ready? When I'm on the mat and I hear my dad on the side, I know that he loves me and he wants to get me like more into the sport. It's the best feeling a kid could ever have. He says, be a leader, not a follower. I always listen to that. The first step's always the hardest in this sport. Once you take that first step, at the very least, you're going to learn a work ethic that sticks with you forever. There's nothing wrong with being tough. You know, there's nothing wrong with being gritty. That's what gets it done on the mat. That's what gets it done in life. Before the girls came along, is, is this where you thought you'd be? Never. It's pretty cool, though. It's awesome. You know, I got two blood daughters and 50 more in the club. Alpha! We are! Alpha! Four, five, six!
day all day. We've got a great show for you on this Tuesday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here, plus Al's latest attempt at a world record. We have all the details on this year's Rokathon. But first, let's kick it off with Popstart. Chrissy Teigen is back online apologizing after recent accusations of past cyberbullying. Carson has the latest on her recent post. Take a look. Mr. Daly, time for some pop start. All right, we're going to do pop start right now. We're going to start with Chrissy Teigen. This week, she is back online to address recent accusations of past cyberbullying. With more on that, NBC News Now anchor Joe Fryer joins us with that story. Joe, good morning. Hey there, good morning. Yeah, so for Chrissy Teigen, this is a return to social media, resurfacing after what she calls a very humbling few weeks spent thinking about her past online behavior. This morning, Chrissy Teigen is publicly apologizing, breaking her social media silence to address past tweets and cyberbullying. On Monday, writing in a lengthy blog post, I know I've been quiet, and Lord knows you don't want to hear about me, but I want you to know I've been sitting in a hole of deserved global punishment, the ultimate sit here and think about what you've done. Last month, Teigen's decade-old tweets resurfaced, showing a string of harassment directed at model and TV personality Courtney Stodd. Teigen told the then teenager in one now deleted tweet captured by BuzzFeed she wanted Stodden to take a dirt nap. Stodden, who identifies as non-binary, made headlines in 2011 when they married then 50-year-old actor Doug Hutchison at age 16. The two have since divorced. Teigen first addressed the controversy in May, saying she has tried to connect with Stodden and tweeting, I'm mortified and sad at who I used to be. I was an insecure attention-seeking troll. I'm so sorry, Courtney. Late Monday, fashion designer Michael Costello posted screenshots of Instagram DMs from Teigen, sharing that he's still traumatized, depressed, and has thoughts of suicide after online interactions with the star back in 2014, and alleges Teigen tried to ruin his career. In her blog post, Teigen says she's privately reaching out to people she has hurt. Not a day, not a single moment has passed where I haven't felt the crushing weight of regret for the things I've said in the past. I have to stop and wonder, how could I have done that? Asking not for forgiveness, but for patience, writing, we are all more than our worst moments. Teigen goes on to say that she'll be taking more time off to be with family and hopes that she will be allowed to own up to these past mistakes in the future. Mm -hmm. Joe, thank you very much for that. Next up, Simone Biles, the gymnastics goat, has stuck a landing on the latest digital cover of Glamour magazine. The seven-time national gymnastics all-around champ is decked out in red, wow. white, and blue, a celebration of Simone representing Team USA this summer in Tokyo. And she opened up in the magazine on what it's been like preparing for the postponed Olympics her upcoming all-female gymnastics tour, and taking care of her mental health. She also sat down to debunk some common misconceptions about gymnastics. In this one, she says she hears all the time. It may surprise you. So gymnastics is not a sport. I hear this a lot, but I feel like every four years, everybody tunes in to watch gymnastics, so it's got to be a sport at least. Right now, I train 32 to 34 hours a week just to compete for about three or four minutes. It's all sports combined in one. You can't just be fast. You have to have like agility. You have to be able to jump. You have to be able to flip, memorize routines. It's kind of all in one. Imagine telling you Simone I, Biles. I can't do this. Is not a no, why did you? Ridiculous. What? ridiculous. You can check out Simone's full glamour cover story available online now. For more info on where to find it, you can go to today.com. She looks amazing too. Yeah. Sure. I know she, she sure glams up. Coming up next on Today Talks, Al's latest attempt at a world record. We'll tell you what he has in store for this year's Rokathon. Stay with us. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, two. So grateful. Is that close to prom? Here we go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah, bright. I We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it.
right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. Welcome back. Today on the third hour, Rokathon is back. Al is going for his 10th Guinness World Record. Take a look. All right, it is time now for Overheard on Third. We just teased it because this is huge. Rokerthon yeah. is coming back. <laughs> he just made the announcement this morning. Yep. It's time to set another Guinness World Record. Can we just recap some of the things Al has done already? Sure. A 34-hour marathon That's weather I forecast. Thought. I thought he was going to die during that one. We all did. Oh, no. It, oh, got, Dylan was open. It got questionable. <laughs> it got real questionable there for a second. You thought I had a cat. Um, you also reported the weather in all 50 states in just one week. Um, and you made sandwiches with 60 chefs over Zoom during the pandemic. So, what is the big reveal for this? Okay. Program? Well, this year, it starts on Monday. Okay. Uh, and you can catch it on our air, and the whole thing will be streaming on today.com. We are going to be doing a live streaming weather forecast from all 50 states uh, live all together. It's going to take a number of hours to do. But, uh, would, like handing it off? Handing to, it off. Oh, uh, that's uh, fine. Instead of passing a baton, we will be passing a beach ball. So all of our stations will be coming from recreation areas, beaches. That's things fun. Like that. That's a great uh, idea. Uh, Summer forecast. Parks. Yeah, all it says we reopen America. Baby. That's cool. That's I feel like a it's great a combination idea. of all your Rokerthons. Yes. Uh, so we, yeah, after a while, yeah. What, what are fun you fact, <laughs> do you know how many world records Al Roker has? No. What'd you say? Nine. That's wow. That's, oh, you were listening earlier. And nine's my number. Yeah. What is nine. He has nine. Number? It is nine. He has nine. Wait, nine more? There's nine more records. Yes. Can you nine. really quickly blow through them? Do you not know them? <laughs> you don't know all nine? There's no way. Okay. Go, go. Uh, we did a 34-hour live weather broadcast. Okay. Uh, we also did... 50 states in in five days okay uh we did uh, uh the, the number of we did the sandwiches that's the that's last true. one we did a college we did five colleges oh, yeah. where we did that's uh, four crab walking well no but there were five colleges oh, oh and you did uh, a world each record day we each. did a world record well, you do remember all your records yeah, yeah. that's impressive so, so wow. there you have it okay is, is that, that record for world records uh yes but i'm i don't think i'm we're even close oh, okay. no. well, we're gonna get him there that's though the next yeah we got plenty of time that's right rokerthon 50 uh okay is it ever okay as a parent to tell your kids a little white lie? Yes, absolutely. Like what? Um, we're out. If we're we're out of way. candy. We're out of. We're out of whatever sweet okay. they want in the pantry. Well, well, we asked because on TikTok there's a video of uh, mom tricks going viral. Sky Lefebvre talked about little lies that she tells her kids, like how they have to turn the TV off because the people <laughs> in the TV. Need, need to go, go to sleep. sleep. <laughs> so, That's actually a good one. I, I do like that one. Those I mean, good. I just said to Calvin yesterday, I mean, I guess it's kind of true, but he didn't want to eat the salad. He wanted the salad, then he, of course, didn't want to eat yeah. it. I'm like, well, you have to eat the salad because it, it prevents you from getting sick. Well, actually, no. That's, That's not a lie. True. That's kind yeah, of true. That's true. If you don't want no. your kid to get scurvy. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Scurvy is yeah. not scurvy. The only thing yeah. my mom ever told yeah. me is yeah. if I frown, my face would get stuck that way. Oh, yeah. You see, I'm an overall kind of a happy person. That's why. Or if you swallow gum, it sits in your stomach for eight years. That's true. It is, is it? not true. I don't think it is true. not true. true. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, just 48 hours until my skydiving adventure will have all the latest on my big jump. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. has been a long year yeah where it's been anything but normal well now there's hope the covid vaccines i know i know it's been a little confusing like really confusing so it's more important than ever to make a plan visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine what are you waiting for roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine plan your vaccine 
Plan your vaccine. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, I get more advice on my big jump. Plus, it's Tuesday Tuesday with a twist. We want you to pick an outfit and send it in to Hoda and Jenna's social media pages. Check it out. You know what? The countdown is starting to give me the, the nerves. Oh, I think we should ask Tina Fey if she thinks it's a good idea if you jump. I'm sure the answer is going to be <laughs> no, <laughs> because that's what everybody's been saying. Well, but I do like what one of the things that has been making me feel, first of all, blocking it completely out makes me feel better. Do you think about like, okay, no. have, you don't. No. And I, until we bring it up on the show, yes, you're not thinking about it. And then I kind of it. panic internally for a few minutes and then I block it out again. You know again. what? You're, you're good at compartmentalizing your stuff. You I put am. stuff in certain pockets. Until it explodes. Until it blows <laughs> like Mount Everest. And everyone take cover. Okay, because that happens. Okay, well, we've been getting advice for Jenna. So here is our latest advice. This is uh, uh, from Mary. Uh, well, let's see. Mary from, from Mount, Mount Airy. Airy. <laughs> wait, wait, let's do it again. Mary, Mary from, from Mount, Mount Airy. Airy. Mary from <laughs> Mount Airy, Maryland. She's got advice. She's the wife of a U.S. Marine. And how cool is this? Jenna, she actually went skydiving with the U.S. Army Gold Knights. That's the same group you're jumping yeah, with. Yeah, that's the same team that also my grandfather jumped with. So here's what Mary has to say. The day of my jump, I was thrilled to learn that my um, tandem instructor and my videographer were both the soldiers that jumped with your grandfather, President Bush. And wow, I mean, if they were trusted with him, then certainly I was in very good hands. The first three seconds out of the plane was absolutely terrifying. About five seconds in, it was just euphoric. And by the time Mike opened his parachute and we were actually able to talk, I told him, I can't believe you get to do this for your job. And I was ready to go up again. That was amazing, oh my God. Oh my oh gosh, my she was ready gosh. to go up again. How about that, three seconds of, Three, three seconds, seconds is like terror. One, two, three. And then it's euphoria. Okay. That's what you're going to have. I can do it. <gasps> wow. I know. That's so cool. And I recognize Mike. He did you jump did? with my grandpa. Yes. That's Mike. And oh. I think I'm going to see him Thursday. <gasps> I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, now I'm going to compartmentalize again and, and let's talk about Jessica Biel. Put it far away. <laughs> Bury it like we do our Eat. feelings and emotions. <laughs> and then I will take it out when I overeat later today. Or when we overreact to something that wasn't so bad. <laughs> Don't you do that? Yes. Have you ever done that? Like, yes. Like I'm trying to back up the car and like some, Joel will say like, okay, a little further, yes. a little further. You're like this, a little further. Not, not so much. You're like, what? And all of a sudden your head explodes because you remember. Like, and I feel kind of guilty, but this morning, you know, I woke up at the crack. I wake up earlier than Henry. He'd put out my coffee cup, mm. my to-go mug I love, mm. and my little pod next to the Keurig, and a little spoon. And last night I was like bathing the girls, reading to them, where's your dad? I mean, I said that <laughs> out loud. And he came up and he said, I was just cleaning the kitchen. And then this morning when I went down and saw that, so he texted me this morning, that's what I was doing when you said, where is your dad? And it was that like overreaction that was probably bundled up of, you know, other things. By the way, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah, he was just putting and a pot of coffee. Can I share something that Joel does every morning? And I'm not kidding, this happens every morning. I go downstairs every single morning without fail since we started living together. When I go downstairs in the Keurig, there is a pod and my mug under it. And it's, it's nothing, Simple. but it's every, it's every single day. So when I walk downstairs, I know that before he went to sleep, because he usually goes to sleep after yes. me, because I go he to bed. He thinks about you he in the morning. He thinks about you for a minute. Well, yeah. he, he doesn't do that every morning, but he did it last but, night. But that makes it even more special. Oh, it's it like it's so a gesture that wasn't. to wake up and <gasps> see that. And you're right. You're like, where's your dad? And you're and he's like cleaning the kitchen and making your coffee. For the next what morning, I know. Doing? Why didn't I just keep those words deep down where my <laughs> where skydiving goes? <laughs> all of and my things. little fat 13-year-old child lives. Can I go We're gonna back squish in there? everything go in back. the box where you belong. <laughs> all right, so Jessica Beale is talking about, she actually, I don't know if you guys know this, but she had her second baby out of the public eye and it was during COVID times. I didn't, I kind of, I didn't I know that. I forgot too. Or maybe we knew it and we forgot, but she and Justin Timberlake welcomed son Phineas last summer 
and no one ever even knew she was pregnant. They are so good at like keeping their stuff tight. So here's what she had to say about motherhood. And she was on Dak Shepard's Armchair Expert podcast. Take a look. I had like a secret COVID baby. Wow. Oh my God, congratulations. Congrats. It wasn't like a supposed to be a secret. It was just COVID happened. And then I went to Montana with my family and never left. Someone said to me, two is like having a thousand. And, and that's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it feels like. The balance of everything is, is very different and super hard. But yeah. I agree. I mean, it's amazing. It's so interesting. It's so funny. The conversations I'm having now with my six-year-old oh, six is so cool. Like, he's a real person. Yeah. Saying the funniest stuff, and he's so sensitive and tender. Mm. That's like so, listening. Yeah, that's, by the way, just we want to talk about having one child and two child, children, but Dak Shepard is really getting yes. all the guests. And by the way, how about Jessica, who never speaks about these things, talking about that, feeling I think comfortable and safe. in his podcast that allows people the space to just speak their truth, yeah. you know? Because Harry, Prince Harry was on his yes. podcast and spoke, gave a lot of, you know, yes. secret information. Um, I, yeah, and interesting, to go from one to two is not easy. Was Which was harder, one to two or two to three? I don't, I mean, I think... Yeah, after two, is it just like, oh, well? I, everybody, I think because everybody says, oh, after two, everything's just, you know, so then you think it's going to be easier. I think any time you add a child into the mix, it's a little tricky. It's a little you, tricky. And like when she says, I hate the word balance, but I think what she means is till you figure out the rhythm. The rhythm. You know? And how do you, getting, like if you have three kids, you need three car seats. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of That's I mean right. there's and like we, you but can't... we didn't I wanted a minivan. Yeah. Because I wanted get, more space. Yeah, you need room. But we just kept our same just car and all just three jammed in, three, in, three the back. in the back. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So Tuesday, Tuesday is usually today, but we're gonna take a little break because <laughs> we actually need your help in a big, big way. Okay, every week you guys vote on three pre-selected wardrobe choices for each of us, but we want you to actually help pick the outfits yeah, out themselves. The three. We don't want you we don't want to give you three and say pick one. We just want you to go to like the store basically yeah. online Zara. and pick something for us. So head to Hoda and Jenna social media pages, our Twitter, Facebook, Insta stories. Anyway, we're gonna have some shoppable links for dresses, jumpsuits, pants and blouses. Yeah, so. just send us the shoppable links. Yeah. You send us what you think we should wear and who knows, your pick may just Turn Wouldn't up. that be cool? I bet you I some, like that yeah, idea. I love that too. Because really, we're just shopping from our own closet, and people and the, don't seem to like and, our closet because well, it's the same old stuff. <laughs> All right, guys, we love a cute video, and Megan Trainer, whom we adore posted the cutest video of her four-month-old son, Riley. First of all, I cannot believe Riley is already I know, four months. I know, and speaking like a genius. Well, these were apparently his very first words. <sighs> Please listen extra closely. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs> Wait, 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 roll what? it again. We have to roll it again. Okay, that was so clear. That was like, wait, that was clear. By the way, they were celebrating Daryl. Um, wait. <laughs> yes, yes, he said it. <laughs> Riley said it. It's Daryl's birthday, by the way. That, that was actually, that was Daryl's birthday, the 29th. It was his 29th birthday. But, okay, I love you. It took how? I, uh, it was yeah. almost two to say I love you. For four months Wait, to speak like that? two? No, no. Almost, almost two. <laughs> I mean, but in like 18 months. <gasps> to say that at four months, he's that kid's I, a genius. It, he said, I, maybe because they're always singing in the house, I bet, and there's always, words. you know, lots of words and yeah, singing. Yeah, are you saying that to make me feel better? I'm going to go and sing. I you mean, remember your kid's first words? I mean... I kind of think, because they go like, da, 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 da. Jimmy Fallon, he made every, every kid do that. Well, it's also just true. What, what about yours? Da, 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 Because it's easy. My Mama. first word, da, da. No, mama's harder to harder say. Harder to say. Which is ridiculous, because <laughs> we're the ones that grew the humans in us. One of my favorite dinner party conversations, I was with sitting next to Meredith Vieira, and Meredith goes, you know, <laughs> on your first kid, you remember everything you write down in the book. You have the book, and you have the shoes, and the baby, but, you know, just the second and third kid, you're like, I don't know. Just my third kid was like, hey, what was my first word? And she, she goes, balloon. And he goes, and she goes, the kid goes, balloon? I had two syllables. She goes, yeah. And I go, really? She goes, no. <laughs> give them a memory. Just move on. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> just give them a memory. Oh, mean, how balloon. many times do I say I have two girls, and you're like, <laughs> and the no boy. Son. My girls and your son. No, he, 
I think also it makes the third, you're the youngest, right? I'm the middle. Oh, I'm, the, the middle. I'm the Yeah, I'm the jam. I was like, I think the, sometimes the youngest is just super chill because they've kind of been ignored. Well, yeah, I think there is something about, because think about how we hovered over yes. our first and our second were just kind of looser and they were like so much cooler. And yes. we're like, why, this, why is she so much cooler in that way, yes. calmer? Yes. But that's because of us. Yeah. We did it. We do everything that's bad. How are you? I'm okay. Thank you guys for having me. This is so nice. Craig, this book is personal, mm -hmm. and I, you know, it's very vulnerable. You yeah. know, I think Hoda and I are both so proud of you because we see you as this friend and this colleague who's buttoned up and telling the news. And I can tell you're a little bit yeah uncomfortable, nervous, <laughs> a little nervous about telling your own story. Yeah. But it is brave. So what yeah. ultimately decided made you decide to do this? I, you know, I, a couple things. I mean, I, I my dad and I just got to such a good point. And he and I had some conversations about his story doing some good, and he wanted to do some good. And uh, then the pandemic hit, I had a lot more free time on my hands. So both of those things just sort of converged, and, and that's, that's, that's how we got ever, it. Did you ever think you'd see your dad go to AA? I mean, no. like you said, you knew him your whole life. No. Were you shocked when, when he when finally the intervention happened and finally he said yes to it, because he still needs to say yes. Stunned, because yeah. we tried before. Yeah. I mean, we tried interventions over the years and they just didn't stick. And this time, we were, the last time we did it, we enlisted a professional. Oh. And that, that, that made all the difference. We enlisted a professional, and I write about it in the book. It also helps, it's funny now, it wasn't funny at the time, it also helps that when we had the intervention, he was blackout drunk. The oh, next morning, I called, I called the, uh, the facility where, where he went, and I checked in on him, and the doctor was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's fine now. He's in our, our sober tank. Uh, he didn't remember going. Um, you know, I think the other part of this story is that it's a true love story mm -hmm. because it's about forgiveness. Yeah, it is. And redemption. It is. And grace. Yes. And those are things that I think we, we see glimmers of them yeah. in our society, but not like as clearly as, as I think you were raised to see. It, it, it became apparent to me over the last couple of years especially that I, I, had to, I had to forgive my dad. Not, not for him, for me. Yeah. I had to forgive, forgive him for myself, but I also wrote this to help him understand that he's forgiven. Mm -hmm. Because for a number of years, he would, he would feel so bad mm -hmm. about the years that he missed and how he wasn't really there. And, and I wanted him to know um, while he's, you know, still with us. Well, I wanted to give him his flowers to make sure he understood <laughs> all, all is right. Well, he gave you, you gave him his flowers. He gave you that letter that you talked mm. about, that well, those yes. were your flowers. And we know that faith is like real big in your heart. You talk about it here, you feel it, we feel it from you. And how special is, there's one particular um, uh, hymn that you love. It's called, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Yes. Mm. Well. New Life Baptist Church. <laughs> no, Decide, we didn't. Well, oh, yes, we did, honey. Let's take a listen. This is my childhood to that. church. Listen. <laughs> That's my childhood church. Yeah. I know. And that's your aunt at the end? That's who you were <gasps> with. Your grandma oh, took you there, right? Oh, I grew up. That, that, uh, you have no idea how much that means to well. me. Um, I was shaped and molded and formed uh. by, by, by that church. By that I sang in the choir, you know, 40 years ago <laughs> with, with my grandma in that church. And there's your Aunt Wanda. I didn't know uh, your Aunt Wanda was, uh, in the, was in that number. Her nickname's Boo. Well, Whoa. we love Boo, but we love you more. So good luck um, and, and enjoy your book tour. Yeah, and we're just so proud of you. Receive all the goodness that's yes. coming to you. you can... I know we're not supposed to be hugging. Oh. Oh. So we love mm -hmm. you. Happy Father's Thank Day. You. Thank you. Just so sweet. Happy Father's Day. Today Talks continues after the break. My exclusive chat with Hoda you can only see here on Today All Day. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Today. Future's looking yeah. nice. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. <laughs> Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. 
What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, Tampa. Yes. So grateful. Is that close to crying? Here we go. America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland, reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Welcome back to Today Talks and our exclusive content you can only see here on Today All Day. Yeah, we had um, we had so many great guests today that we loved. We yes. loved seeing Tina Fey in the flesh. That was crazy. We keep saying that she was our very first guest in the studio, but quite frankly, <laughs> your dad might have been our very Why first guest. Why did we say that? I think we said it because your dad was in a different category. Well, He's a he, former president, and most of it was on the plaza, except for an when interview, you had an interview I did, in here. Right, in these exact yeah, chairs. Actually, Al came up this morning. Yeah. First of all, yeah. to hear Al's music playing, and Al's always like, "Hey, morning, JBH." He's like, "Why are they saying she's the first guest?" And I was like, "Oh, that's a good." Yeah. Point. Well, I mean, I think like the first kind of entertainment, like guest that isn't nor isn't a reg like a regular guest that yes. we would have on our show. Yes. Your dad was an exception well, in the no, category, the swearing in all ceremony. by himself. But by the way, girls, five Eva. Please listen to that song called um, I'm Afraid, but don't do it with your kids Does in the room. Does it have bad words? Yes. Not terrible words, but words that you don't want to explain to your kid. It's so, it's so hilarious and silly, but it's so funny to hear great singers like Sarah Bareilles yes. and um, Renee Elise Goldsberry and Busy, and Busy Phillips and Paula singing beautiful songs but are, that are crazy sounding. It's I, a good one. You know what's so funny mm. you were just saying about don't watch it with your kids in the yeah. room. I interviewed these authors yesterday. Yeah. Three authors that I respect so much. And one of them, Ruman Alam, he yeah. wrote Leave the World Behind, which okay. is going to be turned into a movie with Denzel Washington and Julia Roberts. We have oh. this kind of Wait, Denzel and Julia yes. again together? Yes. Pelican Brief. Yes. yes. And this and this book is so good. <gasps> I can't wait to see the adaptation. But yeah. my point is we have this kind this texting relationship, yeah. mainly via Instagram. I think of him as a friend, yeah. where we talk about books to read to our kids. Oh. Okay. And I'm just so fond of it because <laughs> Wait, so everyone texts books. So ideas? everybody kind of texts. He texts me, he has a child close to Mila's mm -hmm. age. And, and we had this moment where I said, reading Charlotte's Web to Mila, yeah. which if you, I, Haley's the age. I know, but I'm afraid. You said she cried at the yeah, end. Yeah, but it was the most beautiful. The writing is so beautiful. I can't tell you. They write about crickets and summertime ending and seasons changing. And it's poetic. And maybe this is. Well, I love that. I'm just worried. Well, the whole dying topic just came up for us. Oh, yeah. She goes, Haley goes, what happens when you, when you die? And I go, well, you go to heaven. She goes, well, can we go together? Oh. And I said, well, um, I'll definitely be there when you get there, for sure, waiting. And she goes, how do we get there? Just like listening to a four-year-old's, where do we sleep? On the clouds. She was looking up. It was just like so beautiful, but it was so like, there's like an innocence before that conversation happens. Yeah. And then that one happens. And then another one happens and another well, one. Well, you're and right. You... And we, I guess, Mila, we really went there because yes. I lost a lot of family members. Yeah. But we were saying, we were talking about Mila just read Because of When Dixie, which oh, was yeah. a book I studied as a little girl. I couldn't quite remember it, but the mom leaves. And Mila said before bed, well, mommy, you're never going to mm. leave me, right? And I said, I'm never going to leave you. She goes, not even for Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> not even for Oprah. And I said, not even for Oprah. See? <laughs> <laughs> not even for Oprah unless she asked. Unless asks. she asked you. Bye -bye, but you're Mila. right. It's like, that's what I ask Ruman. I say, what books are appropriate for this yeah. age level? Well, yeah. Because you're going to have to We're, have Eventually it has to. Yeah, you have to. And you keep, I know, it's and better not to Charlotte's stall And maybe Charlotte's Web is a good way to start it. Okay. But maybe wait a summer. Okay. okay. All right. Well, that's it for today's episode of Today's Talk. Keep watching for more today. All day, guys.
we start with a That's cheers. Right, cheers. And congratulations to the author on the new yes, book. Yes, the new book. Uh, it's a heck of a book, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Just in time for Father's Day. Yeah. Thank you. What, 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 what prompted it? Because it's, it's, it's a pretty honest, raw look at, at, at a situation that a lot of people might not be willing to share. Um, it was cheaper than therapy during the pandemic. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, it was a couple of things. I mean, I, when I started doing the series for the show on dads, I started to, to meet a lot of guys like us who were extraordinary in, 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 in terms of the way they parent, but otherwise ordinary folks. Um, and I think that led me to start to really look at the relationship I have with my dad. Which you know, I mean, you know, you you you've met Dad, and we've come a long way. But growing up, it was it was hard. Um, there was the addiction, and then I mean, there were the well, there were multiple addictions. But um, for a long time, I sort of blamed him. You know, I was angry, and you know, and then was he around much? Yeah, I mean, he was he was there. He was there physically, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, and uh, and he worked third shift, which didn't help. Uh, obviously, he so he was sleeping during the day, working at night, and and so I, you know, grew up. And the older we got, the worse the drinking got. And uh, by the time I left for college, like we were, you know, almost estranged in some ways. Mm. And he wouldn't show up for you know little league, like you know we're all there for our, dad. Didn't too much. Do, I'm there too much. <laughs> well, but what, what do you think? It might also be, in a sense, generational and cultural. Yes. You know, in yes. that, you know, growing up, you know, he was a, a black man in the South at, at a tough time, yeah. a different time. Yes. He, you know, and this is something I found out during the course of the book. Like, my dad didn't know who his father was until he was almost a teenager. And I think it's wholly unrealistic to expect someone to be something that they haven't seen. Right. So my dad didn't, you know, he didn't have a dad. And so he did, you know, exponentially better than his father had right. done. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, 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 and as you know, you know, sometimes, especially in the black community, especially back then, like if, if you were just there, like if you were in the house and right. you were working, that was enough. That was it. Um, the but, first line of your book, yes, man, the very first line, right? The, you remember the opening line? Yeah. He was born in a West Virginia prison. That's how the book opens. Yeah, like, whoa. Um, and, and fun fact, also the same prison that Billy, Billy Holiday served her time in. Martha Stewart did her time there. Back then, by, uh, by standards of the 30s, it was very progressive for, uh, for, for women in terms of teaching like skills and trades. And, um, but it's, it's funny because by the time I come, come along, like the only grandma I knew like, was the grandma that knew the Lord. Like she was, in, she was at the church four mm -hmm. or five days a week. She was an usher and you know, it, that, that, was, that was the grandma that I knew. I wish I had known what I knew now, like back then, because mm -hmm. I could have peppered grandma with all kinds of questions. Right. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Congratulations to Lester Holt, the most trusted TV news anchor in America, on receiving the prestigious Edward R. Murrow Lifetime Achievement Award for a career dedicated to excellence in journalism. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. But here's the thing, uh, you know, you talk about you know you you parent the way you were you were raised, 
And I've seen you as a parent, as a dad. You're a terrific dad. What, what, how did you make the jump? I mean, fortunately along the way, I've always had men in my life who you know, I can look at and, and emulate the behavior personally, professionally, like you two. I consider both of you mentors. You, nice. And you for different reasons than Carson. Age. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> longevity. Yes. Although, hell, I guess the same could yeah. be said for you. I Maybe. Mean, Carson Daly's been in the game a long time. I have. Four kids. So, no, it's a, um, but it's what's been cool is my dad was just up here two weeks ago. And he was up here for six days. What is your relationship with him now? It's best it's ever been. Like, he'll, he'll call now and just random, middle of the day, hey, just come check on you. Has he read the book? Oh, he read He was the first person to read it. What did he say about it? I was, I, I, it's probably the most nervous I've been, yeah. minus when I proposed to my wife. Um, I said, it's all there. It's good. It's good. Yeah. That was it. That's all he said. I said, any changes? Anything I got wrong? He's like, no. It's all there. Didn't change a word, You think a story. he recalls the past as you do? Um, there are parts of the book that he did not remember. I'm sure, yeah. Um, there are parts of the book, there are good, good chunks of the book where he didn't know that I felt the way that I did at the time. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't, I mean, we just didn't talk like that. Right. Like, we just, that's not the, I've heard you talk about the relationship that you had with your dad. I right. Mean, you had a, a pretty, sounds like a pretty solid relationship with your dad. Yeah. Um, I have one now. I'm thankful for it now. Right. Um, I wish I'd had it you know, 20 years ago, but what can you do? But, you know, I, I see these pictures of your dad with your kids, and I, it makes me smile. Mm. I think about it now, and, and what, a, what a great gift. It's the greatest gift, Al. Uh, when he was up here a couple weeks ago, he played in that driveway. He played basketball with Dell. So great. And, like, 90-degree heat. That's like, all Dell will ever know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, exactly. Which, which is all that matters. It, riding bicycles. We went to, to Dell soccer game. He's on the sideline. Like, he's, like, coaching the team. Like, he was that into it. First 30 seconds of the game. My son hadn't scored all season. First 30 seconds of the game. Dribble, dribble, dribble. Shoot, score. Uh, and my dad was, like, standing, like, inches away from me and got to see that. Um, you know, he never made any of my soccer games or baseball games, a couple of baseball games, but, but having him experience that, right. it, um, I don't know, it, it, it really, in terms of our relationship right now, it's just, I'm so thankful for mm -hmm. it, so thankful. Because, you know, like, it could have gone another way. What has the reaction been from, from people who thought that they knew you and didn't realize you have this story to tell? Um, I, I think the reaction is akin to what you just said. I don't think there are a lot of people that really know me. And that, that was, that, that, that's, not, that's not a good thing, probably. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, but my dad was always walled off. I've never been a fan of emoting right. or, or, or sharing. And um, with well, this, What does it feel like? to get it, it's out there now, people I'm, are reading about I'm, it. I've never been more nervous or frightened or scared or anxious. Don't you feel relieved? It. No. That's not a I don't thing? think I do relief. Wow. Um, I was relieved, scratch that, I was relieved when my dad read it. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and my dad signed off on it. And I was like, okay. Halfway through, I realized I wasn't writing this book for like strangers. I was writing it for me I wrote it for my dad, right. I wrote it for my kids. That's why it's a good book. Yeah. Um, and once I realized that, I, I, that helped frame everything. There, the, 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 the highlight was I would go down to the basement and I'd pour myself a little bourbon and I would interview dad. And so I've got like hours of his voice. I'd never heard my grandfather's voice, either one of them. So I've got hours of his voice on tape. Oh, that's cool. Like answering questions, like there's stuff not in the book, mm -hmm. like that's on tape that the, the great grandkids are here one day and they're like, oh, oh, my great, great grandfather, he was, he was, he was a piece. He was well, a piece of work. I will tell you the gift that you've given your children without even realizing it. And Carson, I don't know, you, you, you've lost your dad. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've, I've always dealt with is, uh, I mean, I, I, I remember what he looks like, I know what he, but, I've had to like play back some video recordings because I can't remember his voice. Your dad? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I know his voice, but can't just so that. I can hear it, I have to play, go and put in a, you know, the the, the VHS and mm -hmm. watch it. At least just you have his videos. Yeah. yeah. But, and he but, was on the show once too. Yeah. yeah. You know. You and, don't have recordings, Carson? I do actually. Uh, it's on a medium that I don't even know what it is. It's the smallest little cassette tape. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
but Those yeah, dictaphone tapes. Dictaphone tapes, yes, I do have them. And uh, on the heels of this, I'll go back and listen because I, when my dad died when I was five, I remember feeling tremendously guilty, even though my mom married Dick, my stepdad, who I credit for being, you know, I always say God bless me with two incredible dads. But I used to feel guilty as a kid um, that I, my, because I was so young when my dad passed that I forgot what he looked like and what he sounded like, and I thought that was my fault. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I remember working through that as a kid. Yeah. But then it was so quickly replaced by such a great dad that, yeah. you know, it all fell into place. You 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 said something a, a moment ago, jokingly, you said, uh, this is cheaper than therapy. But you said you talk with your therapist. Oh, yeah. You know, the, again, something that a lot of men don't want to admit to or, or admit that by they the need way, to. By the way, to build on that, I mean, I've been doing so much work in the mental health space, as you both know. Fathers and sons going there and having a conversation. How are you feeling today? Mm -hmm. What's in your feelings? That's something else that is... Um, just doesn't happen, especially in communities of color. No. And I think about your book being out and you being so willing to talk about this. Have you thought about the impact that you're having for young men who look like you? That's the, that's the hope. That's the hope. Like I, I, I have a number of friends who are either estranged from their dad or have these terrible relationships with their fathers. Uh, and I, I wrote it in part for, for, for them and for that reason. Like there's, you know, it, it's, I, there's a part in the book I write, I write about where I knew that my dad was a changed man when I went to his rehab facility. And part of part of the rehab was you have to sort of, you know, you make amends and you write these letters and you talk face to face with the people that you've you've wronged. And I get down to Statesboro, Georgia, and uh, I see my dad, and he gives me this big hug. And we're not big huggers, right. we're not a hugging family. I was like, oh, dad's hugging. And he gives me this hug, and I'm crying. He's crying. He gives me this, this letter that he's written. 40 years, my dad's never written me a letter. Right. He's written me this letter. Um, and we sat and we had breakfast. And it was just, like, it's one of those, like, I know on my deathbed, I'll remember mm. that day. And in that moment, like, I knew, I knew it had worked. Um, but a large part of what he did in rehab was therapy. Like, every day, individual sessions, work. group sessions, it, 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 it is work. But it worked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then after that, you know, he did 90 days of, of AA meetings, 90 straight days every day. Um, and it's, but no, like it, it, you don't, you, we don't talk about it as, as fathers and sons, um, and especially in our community, Al. Yeah. Like it's just not. But it's, but it's, get, but it's getting better. It's, it's never too better. late for your dad to be no. a hero, though, right? Like yeah. as sons, you look up to your dad. Yes. It's never too late. Like we love our dads so much. As a dad, we think, oh, I blew it, man. Like, I can't go back and make a, there's not a, you can't have a, uh, you know, there's not a first impression mm -hmm. after, you know, it can't, there's not a second impression after the first, whatever. You can't go back in time. And, and but as a, as a son, we're like, that breakfast, yes. that was everything. That's all you needed. Yep. You know, like, you're good now. Yep. You remember it on your deathbed. Yep. Yeah. As a son, we think that, but as dads, we hold, we, we probably would bear that burden that we have to be good for, oh, yeah. for their entire lives. Yeah, I, I was really fortunate. My dad, my dad was more the nurturer than my mother was. Really? My dad was a, a hugger, yeah. a kisser. I didn't know that men weren't supposed to kiss until I'd go to some family reunions, wow. you know, and I'd go to my, my, my Uncle Champ. Hey, Uncle Champ. Whoa, hey, 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 how you doing? You know, it's, not and, how we do it and, here. And it's, that's right. What, 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 what's going on there? This is, it's not, this is a different kind of movie, you know, so. Meanwhile, but, we hug and kiss. I mean, I, of course, you're probably the same way. I know you are. Hug and kiss the kids all the time. Every second, I guess. Yeah. All the time. Every second. It's a, um, but it, you know, it's, it's interesting because, of course, you just said something. Like, it's never too late for a dad to be a superhero. And that, yeah. that's part of what I wanted people to take away. Like, it's, you know, it's not, it's not a story of, like, addiction and absenteeism. And it's a, it's a story of resilience, mm -hmm. it's a story of overcoming. It's a story of, of how when there's someone that you love, you don't write them off. Like it's, you know, right. there are a lot of folks that have people in their lives that struggle with addiction and they just get to a point, it's like, I've done all I can do. Yeah. I've done all right. I can do. You know, it's, and we got to that point and this was sort of our last ditch effort and we tried before and lo and behold this time, he went into rehab and it, it changed. Now granted, you know, he was drunk at the time he went to rehab and didn't remember the intervention. Right. Uh, but once he got in, that's why he was there. There you go. Yeah. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. 
Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all for reading the book, by the way. That, it's a great uh, that, book. That, it's that, terrific. That, that means Congratulations on it. Yeah. Um, Another uh, thing that sticks out for me about the book is to be a great father, it takes great women in your life. Uh, and I've been lucky enough, you know, my mom, who you both knew, was such a powerful force in my life, losing her husband and her mother in the same year in 1979, uh, her raising us. Um, she was so important. And then my sister, who's my older sister, who basically raised me. Um, I wondered about the women in your in both of your lives yeah. that you attribute some of your successful fathering to. My mother, like I, there's, there's like you can't be as good of a father as you are now without her, right? No yeah. way, right? Me neither. Not, not even fatherhood. Like I would personhood. Not, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like my mother, God bless her. Like you know, she was, she grew up. In, in the moms. 50s and 60s. To moms. To mothers. Hell, yeah. yeah. To moms. Because we get the Father's Day, but yeah. Yeah. we all know behind every good father is an even it's better woman. Mother. Yeah. No, my mom, she, you know, she grew up 50s and 60s. First, first, like, to integrate her high school. Mm. Um, grew up in the projects and got kicked out of the projects because they couldn't pay rent. Moved to some new projects. Like, um, her dad wasn't around. Like, dealt with addiction. Then she had to practically help rear her three siblings. She was the first in the family to go to college, first in the family to get a master's degree. And when my father started to struggle mightily in the 80s and 90s especially, first with booze, then with gambling, my mom had to go out and get a second job. Like she was a school teacher. She would, she would teach, come home, make sure that we hadn't killed each other, my younger brother and I, and then she would go work at this pharmacy uh, to and make And what little money she was making teaching, wow. yes. she gambled it away? Yes! Oh, oh it was... It was like, and so, it, obviously, when you're 12, 13, you don't appreciate that. Right. But as, I, as I've gotten older, right. like, mom, like, she put the family on her back for, like, a decade. Right. And, and carried us. And, right. and all the while, made certain that, that we didn't understood. Didn't feel it. No, we didn't, we didn't yeah, feel we didn't it. No. And there was never, like, we could never use anything as an excuse. Like, it's not like, oh, you know, my dad's got these addiction issues. I'm struggling in high school. Or, oh, I can't. No, Ma, there was no, like, if you complained, you did not. It was just, but, and looking back on it, because at the time, all we did was complain. Sure. Like, oh, mom's got to go to violin. Oh, she signed me up for oratorical contests. Like, that right. was my high school activity. Right. Uh, Which is what made you who you are today. Well, that, and now I, you realize it. But back then, I was like, Dude, mom is just, and now, uh, it, um, it's, um, my, I love my father, you know, and, and we've, we've come to a good place, but let me tell you, my, yeah. I would walk across hot coals. Right. Now, that being said, Carson, Al, I gave her a copy of the book. Mm -hmm. The book is called Pops. Oh, so yeah. it's a book about my father, of naturally. Course. Mm -hmm. So I gave her a copy just to make sure it was all accurate. Mm -hmm. I mean, just factually accurate. Yeah. Right. 
typos and stuff. Things like that. Yeah, I just want to make sure my memory enough is mem Enough mentions of Betty Lou. Got well, she, uncle's name's correct and dates and times. She used it as an opportunity to, to make notes. What did she say? What were her notes? What didn't she say, Carson? Oh, oh, I got a series oh, of, uh, series like of pages notes. Pages of notes? Conversations of notes. Oh. And uh, she, she would say things like, because I love my mother, but she can be a little passive aggressive. She'd say, well, you know what I mean? That's how you and your father remember it. Oh, well, I mean, it's that, well, that's how you remember it. I mean, they, oh, there were some. Right. And then so I had to get to a point where I realized, oh, oh, I know what this is about. Like, she carried the family, but I wrote a book about, right. you know, right. dad. So the next book will have to be. Your moms. It'll have to be. Right. It'll have to be oh, Betty yeah. Joe. There you go. Got it. Have you ever thought about writing, writing a book about, like, your mom and dad and, and... Well, I've included them in, in some of the, the, the past books. Uh, you know, and, and like I said, you know, my mom was you know, one of those people who, like you're, she was the first black cheerleader at John Adams High School mm -hmm. in Queens, uh, you know, back in the, in the 40s. And, that's you know, a big deal, like, that's, yeah. that's the 40s. Yeah, that's... yeah, and, 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 you know, she, look, she, my dad was a black man who was an artist, couldn't get a job as a commercial artist, so he got a job as a bus driver mm. to support his family. And she went out and worked as a, as a, you know, a nursing assistant when I, we were younger. Eventually ended up staying home, but you know she, you know she was. They were they were partners. Al and Izzy. You didn't see one without the other. Uh, and in fact, after he passed, it was I, I couldn't quite put my head around just dealing with her by herself mm. because they were Our they tandem. were they were a package. Yeah. They were a package deal. Uh, you know, but and then, you know, but she was honest. She was one of these. I, I was just I, I when I did the toast to for uh, Leela Courtney's wedding. You know, one of the things my mother said when she first met Deborah, uh, you know, after they got to know each other for a while, you know, she said, uh, "My Deborah said, oh, I, I love you, Mom. And she goes, well, you know, I like you a lot. I, <laughs> I, I don't know you well enough. Love's a big I word. Love you, but I like you. I'm sure I'll come to love you. And I was like, oh, boy. And I don't think I didn't hear about that. Right. But they did come to love each other. And, and I'm so fortunate that, you know, Deborah puts up with me, you know. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. I think we try and extract some things that our parents did that we, that we like about parenting, and then there's other things they did for us that I, I actually don't think was great. Like, an example is my mom gave my sister, when she was 16, a, uh, a new car. And it, like, that was like, wow, she gets a new car at 16, that's pretty cool. And then she proceeded to, every time my sister did anything remotely on, she'd be, give me the keys to that car. Oh. Give me the keys, I bought you a car. And, and I'd be like, that's not fair. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, just take the car. I don't yeah. even want the car. If you're going to use it against me. So, yeah. like, that's something I probably wouldn't do. But, you know, in our generation, there's so much helicopter parenting. Every oh, yeah. parent wants to be their kid's best friend. So I find it hard, and I'm always looking to strike the balance of being very close with my kids and being on the level with them. I play Fortnite with Jackson, or I get on TikTok. I want to know what they're seeing and mm -hmm. doing and be on their level, but also not be their best friend, still be no. dad. Yeah. And I'll be that bad guy, and I want to teach him right from wrong. To. And, it's and tell them the hard truths of life. You know, I'm not afraid to go there. I try and make everything a teachable moment. 
It is tricky. It's tricky to find that balance. How did you, I mean, in terms of not spoiling the kids, you know, how do you, uh, I'm, I'm proud, I mean, Nick doesn't, only Nick actually has a little after school job, but every one of, all of my kids have a job. They always had have, a job, yeah. have had a job. Really? If, you know, high school, uh, in college, uh, I had that. My yeah. parents had to get a job. Yeah. You know, same did here. you work? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, my, my parents were always like, got to get a job. 15. Uh, and Yeah. And and so uh, that that was expected of me. And Did you make that a thing for them? Did they know? know? It, what I, what I, I guess I was kind of proud of. And I mean, look, they've seen dad and mom work hard. Uh, they just wanted it. They, they, they liked earning their own money. Right. Uh, so again, we couldn't say, well, you know, lord it over them. They had their own spending cash. Yeah, right. uh, uh, so I, you know, I, I really do. I remember my dad said, you know, I said, well, why can't you be more like my friend? He goes, I'm not your friend. I'm your father. Right. You know, and and there was no. This is not a democracy. No. Right. You know? No. But the truth can be somewhere in the middle there. I yes, to have absolutely. That. I want to rule with an iron fist too. I no, always no. Say, I brought you in this world. I can take you out. Yeah. There that are doesn't rules work. In this house. It doesn't work. It, it used but to. You can't do that all. The Everything's way. changed. It has changed. It, it's changed. And listen, I in like I said, I mean, my oldest is thirty-four. Uh, I've seen it change. I've seen it change between Nick and Leela. Oh, for sure. You know, uh, you've got to adapt uh, because I text with my six-year-old. My six-year-old she can text. Me. She can text from her little iPad. Wow, that's impressive. And emote, and she can spell because she can speak into the thing. So oh. it's like I'm having a conversation with like an eighteen-year-old, but she's six. It's, it's you know, it's crazy. Yeah. Technology has just changed the way parenting. And I don't think it's changed it necessarily for the better. No, but I, you know, no, I do. Except think... knowing where they are. My, I That's, love knowing yes. where they are. That's you know, true. But the, one of the things I, I still, I think my mother drilled into me was uh, certain etiquette, which I think is yeah. important to, you know, to this day. I mean, I'm very proud of my son. You know, he's got his issues, but when he gets uh, uh, a gift or whatever, he writes a letter. And writes a letter. Yeah, we do he that. does. I've gotten, Nick, I've gotten a Nick Roker note before. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, I think, those things. And that you shake are, someone's hand, you look them yeah, in the eye. Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir, no, sir. Our parents no. pass certain things on that, to me, I think are timeless, and it's our job to pass those on. But, but let me tell you the biggest, the, the biggest issue we've had recently in terms of perspective. Like, you remember, it was dinner time when we were growing up. Like, you ate what you ate. Like, whatever mom or right. whatever mom cooked, this that was This is a great dinner. point. I like where you're going with this. Whatever, you, like, that was it. Right. Like, there were dinner. It could be a fish. It could be some sort of right. meat you're you didn't like, oh, recognize. Here's but you ate it because it was on your plate. Yes. Well, now we sit down for dinner. Oh, gosh. And it's like, they think this is like some sort of four-star restaurant. Well, that's your own fault. I'm not eating I know. this. I know. I know. My daughter will say to me, oh, I can't eat that. I'm no, like, no, no, no. That's no. a... No, we a make hamburger. One, uh, I or, make one. Or meal. I don't like fish today. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, no. I, like, I don't like fish today. Yeah. It's well, one meal. Well, the fish meal, likes you today it. and every day. Yes. One yeah. meal. You're eating what we well, and we and yeah, look. We're very we're fortunate because the kids. We don't. We go, we make mac and cheese. No. no and pasta. Not, right. We get like eating. three options every dinner. This is the generational difference. It like, is. I want to be like that. Well, let's but just listen. We fall. No, we don't feel like fighting in that moment. We just want, it's going to ruin that's, my dinner. That's it. Make them some mac and cheese. That's it. It's been three nights in a row. So what? No. That's it. Why ruin the that, night? That, no, because right in the long term, it's easier. To, you, it's you, not the right fight, answer. You fight the. No, no. Listen, I get it. I get it. But again, I don't, right now, I don't have four kids under, <sighs> under 12, 13. Right, I, I don't have two kids under eight. I, you know, but, but early, and I never had, I mean, I had Courtney. And then 11 years later, I had Leela and Nick. So I never had, yeah. I always outnumbered them. That's yeah. true. Right. So. That's a good point. I don't know how you do it. Like, I, like your name came I love up. every second of it, and it's all it's great. It's my wife. I mean, oh, this, it's yes, my serious, wife, serious. man. One point I want to get for Father's Day. Yes. How great is it to watch your kids be with each other? And I was thinking about Courtney getting married and Nick there dancing. What is it like? How great is it? to see your kids with each other, the sibling thing. You know, Jack and Netta kind of fight a little bit, but I'll catch them sometimes. And they're ha oh, it's at night, good night, Jackie. And she'll come over and good night, I love you, I love you. They have their own little exchange, not prompted by me or Siri. And it's like, that is the greatest moment. It's, it's it, you know, and it's funny, they go, I think as they go in and out, yes, as, as they're yes. growing old. But yes. once they get to a certain age, they know that- but The love is there. They're, that the, the, this, these, three people or two people, that is the love right. that will never go away. Yep. That they know each other has each other's back, right. you know, and that it's them against us. You know, so as a cohesive unit, they can come after us.
coming up on Hashtag Cooking, Sama Dada is sharing her favorite dinner recipes that also make great leftovers. If you happen to be dining solo, these weeknight meals are hearty, healthy, and best of all, pretty easy to make, and you'll have a lot to share. I just love the smell of ginger and garlic together. It reminds me of my mom. Aw. It was so cute of me. <laughs> Sometimes it kind of feels like you need an occasion to cook. But guess what? You don't need to be going to a dinner party to make delicious food for yourself. Cause you know what? A party for one? It's hashtag still a party. So I'm gonna show you how to get this party started with my delicious, flavorful, best all ever, and a crunchy, creamy kale salad. Dal is a staple in Indian cooking. It was always on my dinner table growing up, thanks to my mom. My mom and I still shop for our lentils at Indian markets, but you can get them wherever you get your groceries. Little tip for cooking lentils, super important to always rinse them before you cook them. You wanna rinse them until the water runs clear so we get rid of any debris, and then we're gonna soak them. This will allow it to cook faster, and you can soak them either overnight or at least up to 30 minutes. I have my pre-soaked lentils here, and now all I'm gonna do is drain the water out, like so. Get any residual lentils out. Can't leave any behind. They'll feel left out. Okay, I'm gonna let these hang out for a bit while we prepare the base of our dal. I've heated my stove to medium heat and now I'm just gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Let that heat up and then I'll work on my onions, garlic, and ginger. Adding a bit of olive oil here. Let that heat up. Now, I'm gonna talk about my aromatics. So, onions, garlic, and ginger. I cannot imagine any dal without these base ingredients. They're the aromatics that really impart a lot of flavor. It's gonna become really deep and rich and flavorful, especially when paired with a fat like olive oil. I've got one whole onion that I've diced here, and I'm just gonna add it into my oil. We love that sizzle. And I just wanna saute the onions until they're nice and tender and translucent. I'm adding them separately away from the ginger and garlic because I don't want these guys to burn while I cook them with onions. So while my onions are cooking, I'm gonna work on my ginger and garlic. By work on, I mean grate them. I'm using five cloves of garlic here because I love a garlic moment. If that scares you, you can take it down a notch, but I'm always gonna keep it up a notch. I'm just grating this on a microplane until they're nice and really fine. Grating the garlic this fine is gonna allow it to impart a lot of flavor onto this dal, especially when paired with those onions. I'm gonna be grating these forever. <laughs> Don't neglect your onions, okay? You wanna make sure these are happy too. Love garlic, I love garlic. No shame in my garlic game. Well, I'm adding five. Five cloves. We're starting off strong. This recipe is truly one of my favorite plant-based meal options because it's super flavorful, but it's also packed with protein from the lentils, really warming spices. It's one of my favorites. I can't believe I'm microplaning and also looking at a camera. <laughs> I love that for me. <laughs> okay garlic there. Now it's time for our ginger. Again, we can't neglect our onions. We want them to be tender and translucent and a little bit golden before we add the garlic and the ginger, just so we have already some caramelization going on before we hit the garlic and onions. Microplaning the garlic and the ginger is nice because it almost forms this paste, so it's gonna be really easy to cook in with our onions as well. Going with my ginger. Ginger is super healthy for you, and actually so is garlic. I just love the smell of ginger and garlic together. It reminds me of my mom. Aw. It was so cute of me. I know my heart is warm too. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm still grating this ginger. You can leave, I'll still be here grating ginger. <laughs> this is why I have only one bicep on my right arm. <laughs> of my ginger grating skills. 
When you cook the onions and garlic and ginger in a fat like olive oil, it's going to really break down those flavors so it becomes super flavorful and aromatic. We want that when we're pairing it with something like a dal. I'm all done with my ginger. Got my ginger garlic minced grated situation here. My onions are looking tender, translucent, a little golden around the edges. So now it's the perfect time to add my ginger and garlic. You can see how it's kind of a paste. This is gonna be great for that flavor. I'm gonna cook the garlic and ginger in with the onions until all of the flavors really incorporate and it starts to brown a little bit. It smells so good. Now that my garlic and ginger have started to brown in with the onions, I'm gonna add my masala for my spices. My favorites to use here are my cayenne, my turmeric, cumin, and coriander. It's really important that you do roast these spices because you don't want that raw smell or that raw taste. You want it to be super well browned so that it's aromatic. It smells so good. Now that my masala smells really nice, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> now that my masala smells really nice and toasty, I'm gonna go ahead and add my tomato paste. I'm using tomato paste here because I really like to impart that really deep tomato flavor. And when you brown this tomato paste, it's gonna taste so good. When you're cooking the tomato paste, you want it to turn a very deep, dark red brick color. And again, nobody likes that raw tomato taste or smell, so you wanna really cook it through. Now that I've cooked my tomato paste in with my masala, it's time to add my crushed tomatoes. I'm using canned tomatoes here. There is no shame here. I love a canned tomato. I love convenience. You can use diced tomatoes as well. I love a canned tomato moment. I think especially if you're cooking for one, there's no reason why you shouldn't use what's already in your pantry. You wanna cook these tomatoes for about three to five minutes until they reduce and darken in color. Cooking the tomatoes in with the onions, garlic, ginger, and spices is gonna allow it to be a lot more flavorful. Lentils themselves don't have a ton of flavor on their own, so that's why adding all of these different ingredients and spices is gonna be really delicious for the actual dal itself. I'm gonna season with a bit of salt and pepper here. Now I'm gonna add some vegetable broth. And now we're gonna add some coconut milk. Instead of using a cream or a ghee or a butter, we're using coconut milk to give that same really delicious creamy flavor, but without the dairy. Now we're just waiting for it to come to a boil. We're just waiting. We're a little impatient, but we're waiting. <laughs> we're almost there. We're making progress. I love adding coconut milk to lentils because it makes them super creamy. It looks like we're boiling. Now that we're boiling and in business, I'm gonna reduce to a simmer and let it cook for five more minutes. Mmm, smells so good. Now we're gonna add our lentils. We're gonna simmer this for about 30 minutes until the lentils are soft and the curry gets really nice and thick. It looks so creamy already. Just wait till it's done though. All right, see you later. America journey here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action. Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. 
Killer Row, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's been about 30 minutes, so you know what that means. My doll should be ready. It's looking so nice, so thick and delicious, but there are a couple more things that I want to add. I'm going to add in a little bit of sneaky spinach. This is not really traditional, but I do like to sneak some greens in where I can. Just chopped it up. Going to add that straight in there and stir it up until it wilts. Going in there. So you're just going to stir the spinach in until it wilts. Look at how thick that is. It looks so good. And the green adds some nice contrast to the red and yellow lentils, so it looks really aesthetically pleasing as well. Ooh, it looks so pretty. I'm also going to add some fresh lemon juice, just for some acidity. You've got a lot of heavy flavors here, so it's really nice to add a bit of tang at the end. Straight into my pot. We love a little lemon zing. Mix that lemon juice straight in there. I'm going to finish this all off by adding some fresh cilantro. The tender stems are okay, but I like to remove the thicker stems because those are a bit more bitter. You can totally chop this if you'd like, but I'm just going to tear it roughly. Cuz I kind of like those big pieces of cilantro. Oh, it's so pretty. Almost too pretty to eat. Keyword almost. And now it's time for me to serve myself. This doll is super versatile because you can eat it straight up as a soup or you can also serve it with some naan or some rice. Look at how thick that is too. Ooh, it's so creamy. Here's my sneaky spinach. Can't leave them behind. And then to garnish, I'm just going to add a little bit more cilantro on top. Just a little for the picture, you know. This looks so pretty. I have to send a picture to my mom. She's going to be so proud of me. Oh, and I got to get that naan and rice in there too. This is such a party for one. Like I love this for me. This is an amazing dish because it stores really well too, so you can totally freeze it or keep it in the fridge for up to a week. I think it is time for me to taste it. I'm going to go in straight up. Mm. I think my mom and I need to have a doll off. This is really good. I think this would impress her. Don't mind me while I take another few bites of this doll, but next I'm going to show you a kale salad that you are absolutely going to love. Mm. So good. Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What changed that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're gonna repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Ready, actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Roll. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. It is. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. The music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed.
everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. You might be thinking, another kale salad? Sama, did we really need another kale salad? And to that, I say yes, we need this one. It is my favorite creamy, crunchy, savory kale salad that's really gonna make you want to eat your greens. The first step that we're gonna do to make this salad is make our croutons. This is a great way to use up any of your leftover stale bread. Your stale bread is not destined for the trash, it's destined to be croutons. All right, here's my loaf of bread. I'm just gonna slice this up, dice it a bit, and then we're gonna season it. When you're slicing bread, always remember to use a serrated knife so that it can cut through the bread a lot easier. So I really like nice, thick, and crunchy croutons, so I'm gonna cut the bread slices pretty thick so we can get it there. Should be good. Now I'm just gonna dice up these slices of bread. There's nothing better than a crouton in a salad. It really just adds that nice, crunchy, savory element. Plus, I will really just eat bread like whenever I can get an opportunity. This is a great opportunity. Sourdough croutons are my favorite because it's got that nice tang and with the savory elements that we're gonna add, like the spices, it's gonna be so good. I'm one of those people that likes the end piece of a loaf of bread. They exist, I'm one of them. Now that I've got my croutons, all I'm gonna do is drizzle them with some olive oil and then season with salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Seasoning with some salt. Some pepper. You can use your favorite seasonings here as well. But I love these three. Now I'm just gonna toss them. And you know what, this is a dinner for one, me being the one. So I'm just gonna toss this with my hands. Make sure the olive oil and spices really nicely coat the bread. These look nice and evenly seasoned, so now I'm just gonna transfer them to my parchment lined pan. I wanna make sure that these are nice and spread out so they get a really crisp and even bake. So I might even reserve some of these to bake off later so I can get that nice crisp crouton. Now, I'm just gonna throw them in the oven for 10 to 15 minutes at 425 degrees. Make sure you stir them once during baking. Hi everybody, good morning, welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. I joined Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Well, guess what? My croutons are done. They look nice and golden and crisp. So I'm just going to let them hang out and cool while I make my dressing. For the base of my salad dressing, I'm using tahini. 
If you don't know what tahini is, it's simply sesame seeds that have been ground up into a paste that's similar in texture to a peanut butter. It is my favorite savory grounding base for sauces and dressings. To my tahini, I'm gonna add a little bit of mustard, just for a bit of flavor. I'm gonna add some extra virgin olive oil, just a little. I'm gonna add some fresh lemon juice to this dressing to balance out the earthiness of the tahini. I also love a little tang in my dressings. It's gonna be so good. You want your salad dressing to be really bright and flavorful, especially when we're pairing it with a tougher green like a kale. All right, my lemon is in. I'm gonna whisk this a bit. Now I'm gonna add some of my spices. Got some freshly ground black pepper. Some salt. And for a little bit of spice, this seems to be the trend, some red pepper flakes. Now I'm just gonna whisk all of this together. You'll notice that this dressing is starting to seize, which means that it's becoming a little bit difficult to mix. So all we're gonna do is add a little bit of cold water to help everything come together. You can add more or less water to get the dressing to your desired consistency. To me, a tahini-based dressing is really similar to a Caesar dressing, so I really like to use it on kale because there's nothing better than a really delicious kale Caesar. Look at how creamy this is. And no dairy. This looks really delicious and creamy to me. So I'm gonna set this aside and get to work on my kale. To prepare my kale, all I'm gonna do is remove these tough stems. I don't love these stems because they're a little bit too fibrous, so I really don't want them at my party. You can just tear it straight off and discard the stems. You could use a knife to chop this up, but tearing it is a lot more fun. Kale is a really good salad green because it's got all of these ridges that allow the dressing to really get all up in there. See ya. I like to keep the kale in bigger pieces here because when I marinate it in the dressing, it's gonna wilt down a little. I'm a kale whisperer. We're making kale fun again. Really. You thought you didn't need another kale salad? You were wrong. This is the only kale salad you'll ever need. And I'm not biased at all. This is completely impartial. It's not like this is my favorite kale salad or anything. Again, you could have definitely used a knife, but I just made the life choice not to. It's a lot more fun to tear it. Just gonna add my kale to my bowl. And this is where this dinner for one party gets really fun. I get to become a kale masseuse. I'm gonna add this dressing into my kale and just massage it so that the dressing gets all up into the ridges of the kale. Pouring that dressing straight in there. Okay. And now I'm just gonna use my hands, they are clean, and massage my kale. Massaging your kale is super important because it helps to break down those tough fibers in the kale and it really gets the dressing all evenly coated inside the kale. Look at it. The dressing is already coating it super nicely and it's becoming even softer. Okay, I got a little bit too excited massaging the kale, so now I'm gonna go rinse my hands off. The kale has really had a nice massage. It's feeling super zen, so it's time to set it aside and I'm gonna prepare my add-ins. So I'm adding some tomatoes into the salad to add those really nice bursts of sweetness and it's gonna complement both the kale and the dressing really nicely. You can use grape tomatoes here, you can use cherry tomatoes. I find that these are a lot nicer and sweeter so that's why it's gonna be a great complement to this kale salad. That kale is so lucky though, it got a super long massage. <laughs> My favorite part about this kale salad is that you've got a lot of crunchy elements like these sunflower seeds and the croutons and some creamy elements like these beans and avocado. So I'm gonna go ahead and dice my avocado. So 
pretty. To dice this, I'm going to dice it in the skin. So I'm just going to create the dicing inside so it makes it a lot easier to scoop right out and into my salad. I'm creating little hashtags in honor of hashtag cooking. And then I'm going to add into my salad. Scoop it straight out. Make sure you get all the way to the peel, to the skin, so that you can remove the avocado easily, like so. <laughs> okay, this avocado is a bit resistant. It's fine. <laughs> all right, another half. Now we're moving on to another creamy component, my beans. These are gonna be really delicious because they're gonna add some protein, but also be super velvety and creamy in the salad. Add these straight in. I'm using white beans or cannellini beans here, but you can use whatever bean you'd like. Now I'm gonna add some sunflower seeds for another crunchy textural element. I'm gonna reserve some for the top. You can even use pumpkin seeds here if you'd like. And finally, for my croutons. Perhaps the reason you're interested in the salad in the first place. So these guys, I won't tell. I'm like kind of there with you. I'm just kidding, I love everything in the salad. I'm gonna reserve some croutons for the top as well, just to get that crunchiness. Now I'm gonna toss. Now I'm just gonna toss my salad together. There's so many fun elements going on here. It's a very exciting salad. And it's kind of pretty too. You got the tomatoes, which are nice and bright. Avocado. To finish it off, I'm gonna add some sunflower seeds on top. We're a little bit about aesthetics here. Not gonna front and some croutons too. And this is my kale salad dinner for one, which also means that I can eat out of this bowl and no one's really gonna know or care because it's just me. This is such a glamorous kale salad that I cannot eat it without taking a picture first. This will inspire any kale hater or kale skeptic to eat their kale, I promise. Just try it out. Now it's my turn to try it out. And even if I don't finish this all right now, this stores super well because it's just gonna marinate in its dressing for longer and get even more flavorful. Here I go. You just gotta get a little bit of everything. Some of the kale, the crouton, the tomato, maybe it's too much for me to get a bit of everything, but I'm gonna try. Okay. I really am trying to get a bit of everything and it's not gonna work. Will it work? Okay. Here I go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mmm. I mean, Crunch from the sunflower seeds. Wait, I need a crouton. <laughs> really crunchy. <laughs> so good. Can you hear that? You can hear that? Mmm. You know what? I think they're gonna be a lot of kale converts after they try the salad. We are back. I'm Anthony Contrino, and it is time to get saucy. We've got a brand new kitchen and new episodes coming your way this summer. Tune in to Today All Day, Mondays at 11 a.m.
You know how we know it's also going to be a good day. <laughs> Leah Remini is in the house for years. She's made audiences laugh on the hit sitcom King of Queens. And if you haven't noticed, I think she's actually funnier in real life. She her is, script and stuff is good, but oh, yeah. Leah is one of our favorites. She's bringing that signature wit to her newest gig as host of Game Show Network's People Puzzler. Leah woke up early in L.A. Girl, you got up at the crack of dawn for us? Yes, that's how much I love you, too. <laughs> we love you. In fact, we couldn't wait for you to be here because yeah. we just had to ask what has still been happening in your house during quarantine. What's happening? Yes. What's been going on? Lots of uh, weight gain. Um, <laughs> lots of rethinking relationships. Uh, <laughs> Other than that, not a whole lot, ladies. How about you? Where, where is your Where is your husband? Right now, probably yeah. sleeping. <laughs> where has he been for the last couple of weeks? Have y'all been hanging out? No. I try not to, uh, we, you know, we, uh, like the, the other day I was, I don't know, this probably happened last time we spoke, but like he came in the room that I was in watching TV and I looked at him like, <laughs> do we not have a kitchen with a TV? I don't know. Why, why are you, I, aren't we, aren't we, aren't we <laughs> living together, but have our own spaces? Don't we have our own spaces? You know, it's funny. You were talking, I mean, so many of us, I mean, it's so funny because I don't think, I don't think we stand, I haven't st stood on the scale no, much during this definitely time. Definitely not. Because I'm afraid of it. Are you afraid the of scale? it? The yeah. scale? Yes. Babe, I put on jeans the other day just, just to do it. Like, I was like, I'm tired of sweats. I'm tired of, uh, I literally couldn't get like a leg in and I was like, I was starting to google like is there something <laughs> happening in the air because we've been in the in the house so much i was like maybe something scientific happened where it condensed my like super sealed my clothes <laughs> to change the fibers i mean i literally was starting to google it i was literally starting to google it and then i was like huh as i was <laughs> shoving food in my mouth you also, I, yeah. is it true you watched Bridgerton oh, yes. with your with your daughter? You binge watched it. I'm sorry, it's so hard to hear you because my internet went out. So we're like, oh, I'm talking to you. Bridgerton, sorry, Bridgerton. Say it again. Did you Bridgerton, watch Bridgerton? What? Bridgerton, did you, Bridgerton? did you watch it with your daughter? Okay, so my daughter tells me what shows that we should be watching, right? So she goes, okay, so we're going to watch Bridgerton. I'm like, great. So we settle in, we get our blankets, we get our food, <laughs> watch the whole show and I was like okay so let's get going on season two <laughs> there's no season two and I'm like I don't even okay what kind of animal producers put a show on the air with one seat like we're not doing that we're not doing one season of shows this is not torture like to like who does one season of the show I did that in a few hours <laughs> That wasn't enough for you. You're like, move on. Um, there have been, Leah, Leah, some other big highlights. Yes. One was your girl at the inauguration going up to that, when she was getting ready, when she was going up to sing to that mic and it was just the army band behind her, were you, when you were watching it, was your heart pounding? Like, what were you thinking when she was starting? I was thinking, I'm really so proud of her to be part of this moment for for little girls, for uh, people who have dreams to know her backstory, our vice president's backstory. Like it just, it was so. I was just so proud of her. Yeah. And, and uh, of course, I wrote her right away, thinking I wasn't going to hear for a few hours, and I heard from her right away, going, "Yeah, baby," and I was like, "Yeah, baby," and then I wrote like a whole thing. Like, <laughs> Do you understand what this means? Like for your daughter, for my daughter, like it just was such a beautiful, the whole day was just such a beautiful thing to watch. I was glued to the TV. I don't think I've ever watched uh, as much as I did. And I, I just, I was just so, um, I was touched by it. I mm -hmm. was so, I was just so proud. And proud. how about that let's get loud yes. right there in the middle, babe? Yes. Wow. Like that's that's Jennifer, you know, and I love that. It was just, you know, she's from the Bronx, you know, and it was like there you are, you know, and I it was just like that that piece of her that makes her her, you mm -hmm. know.
Your manicure is so I on know, point. We can't stop I can't stop staring at, at those your manicure. Kisses. It's, by the way, so I get these lips, right, on my nail think, with a grill, and I think I'm just like, I'm like the coolest <laughs> mom ever, right? Cool mom. All right, stay So, up. of course, like I show my daughter, and I'm like, you know, what's up? What's up? You know what I mean? What did she think? And, of course, she responds with her 16-year-old, not great, Mom. She said not great. You said another word, but I don't know if I can say it. All right, Leah, don't, don't go, go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Right. You're yeah. about to kick okay. off our game show week. Yeah, we've got two players are ready to go. Greg and Cheryl, they're okay, going to all play along. Okay, listen, set the bar very low. Very set low. It is. It's real low. low. We got you. Coming up after this. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. We are back with Leah Remini, who's kicking off our Game Show Week series we're doing with the help of Game Show Network. Yeah, uh, Leah's the host of the brand new People Puzzler. It puts contestants' uh, pop culture knowledge to the test with crossword clues. So we're going to give it a try today. So we are going to meet our teammates. I am playing with my friend Cheryl Pickett from Brooklyn. Hi, Hi Cheryl. Cheryl. Yeah. And on my, hey. on my okay. team is Greg Beer from Arlington, Texas. Hey, Greg. Hey. All right, Hi. Leah. Oh. Leah's going to tell us how this game works. So, Leah, how does it work? <laughs> Yeah, good question. I mean, I have producers who are talking in my ear telling me how to do the show. It's a crossword puzzle. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're ready. So, this, so usually how it works. This, okay, so this is how it works. Let's just start, okay? Okay. We're ready. All right. So I'm going to, so we're going to say one down, right? So we have the puzzle up. Okay. We go one down. Uh-huh. And I'm going to give you a clue. Okay. M as in Mary, and here is your clue. Ready? Who's going okay. first? Or we both go? Hoda. Okay. Hoda? Hoda? Uh-huh. Hoda team? Some... Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay, something nice for your fingernails. Oh, oh. you know this, Cheryl. You got it. Yeah. Manicure. Yes. Oh. Boom. Way to go, Cheryl. All right. Are you guys ready? Is it our turn? My turn? Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Okay, let's go, yes. Greg. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'm All ready. All right, here we go. Two across, and you get a letter E, and here's your clue. Mascara pumps them up. You know this one. Eye Greg, come on. Eyelashes. Eyelashes. Good. You know, first of all, let me just, you don't get to say and then go to another answer. <laughs> oh, so what We're was the first answer? Slide. We're going to let it slide. What okay, was the first ready? Yes. Yeah, eyelash. I said eyeliner. Eyelash. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh, you said, right. All right. Forget it. Nobody's playing. Okay. 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 Ready? It's already, a, it's already a hot mess, everybody. <laughs> okay. Ready? <laughs> okay, we're ready. Oh, are you ready? Yes. Three across. Your letter W. Okay. Here's your clue. Painful process seen in the 40-year-old version. Cheryl, you know this. Come on, Cheryl. Waxing. Yes. Good job, Cheryl. Waxing. Go, Cheryl. Here, go. Okay. Here we go. Right. Okay, three down. Here are your clues for letters. W, R, and here is your clue. Botox reduces them. You know it, Greg. Wrinkles. Yes. yes, go, Greg. Okay, 
Here we go. <laughs> oh, are you ready? Ready, honey. Oh, okay. Here we go. Four down. You got an S, and here is your clue. Type of magnolias in title of Julia Roberts movie. Steal. Go, girl. Magnolia. Cheryl, you don't need me. Stop. Okay. Right. Ready? Jenna? Yeah, Greg. we're ready. Come on, Greg. You got nope. it. All right. Five across. DR. Here your left. Okay. Grease song, Beauty School Blank. Beauty School Blank. You, you know it. Do you know it? Greg. Dra. Dra. Don't be. You know what? I can't no. tell. We're not on the same team? <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not. It's so sad. Are we not on the same team? I'm <gasps> Yeah. Drop out. Oh. No, you're right. You're right. Oh. You're right. I, you're right. This is a new. This is a new game. This is. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. You should help. You should. Okay. Should, okay. Should okay. I ready? Help? Here we go. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Ready. I don't. Do no, I but... freaking know? Do I know how to do this? No, I don't. Ready, oh, Hoda? You ready, honey? Okay. Six down. PR. Those are your letters. Here's your clue. Partner of Primp. Partner of Primp. Do you know Cheryl? No, I don't um, know. Primp and Oda. Primp and I don't know. Pris? I don't know. Uh, that's what is it? Primp that's and... a big no. What was okay, it? What was it? Over. No, I gotta give them a chance. Oh, you to steal. Oh, we can guess it. Do you know it, Greg? Partner of Primp. Uh, mm. Partner of Primp. First two letters are P R. Pr it's not Pris? Partner of Primp. Primp. Primp and Primp and Oh, sad. Primpin. Nobody okay. got it. What was it? Preen. Primp and preen. Oh. oh. I didn't know that. That's a hard I one. Okay. I didn't know it. By no, the way, I didn't know. Wait, no, and I have the I have the answer here, so wouldn't have guessed it. Okay. <laughs> seven uh, across. We have seven across. Okay. I, I, we're just gonna go to the Okay, seven across. Here are the letters. J E. What's that sound? That oh, mean? it's the end of the round. Exactly. It's the end of the round. Uh so we're oh, gonna take okay. a break. It looks and, like okay. we're in a tie. We're in a tie. So we're, we're gonna a have a tiebreaker okay. question. And Cheryl okay. and Greg, you are going to go out on your own. So grab a piece of paper, a marker. You're going to have 10 seconds to write down this answer. And whoever comes closest to the correct answer will go on to round two. So here's the question. Great. And somebody will, and somebody will let me know that. Okay. Or you you're guys doing it. According to Mint.com. Hold on. Here's the question. You guys ready? Go. The uh -huh. average woman will spend how much on cosmetics in her lifetime? How much money? 10 seconds on the clock. Go. Okay, just write down whatever you think. Okay, show me your answers, please. Hold on, we've got 85%. Oh, oh, I didn't get the question. <laughs> okay, uh, no, and what do you on. have? 10,000. It looks like Cheryl might have it. Sorry, Greg. Cheryl, Cheryl won that round. Because the answer is $15,000. Cheryl, you're getting 1,000. But Greg, don't you worry. Ah! Yes, you are, girl, and everyone's winner. Greg, you get 500 bucks. Yes, good Yay! job, Greg. Oh, that's awesome. All right, don't go anywhere because Leah and our winner, Cheryl, are sticking around for round two of People Puzzler for the chance to double. You might prize double your money. money. Don't right go away. Our across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, two. Yes. So grateful. Is that close to prom? Here we go. 
Ready actors. An indie horror film, a talented young actress, and a deadly shot. Dateline's newest podcast, Killer Role. Action! Subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts. What's about to happen on our plaza is you're all going to get your very first COVID vaccine. I'm excited. She's excited. Three, two, one, check. So grateful. Is that close to crying? Here we go. Okay, and we are back with our round two of People Puzzler, hosted by our favorite, Leah Remini. We love her. Okay, before the break. And you can see why. She's doing an amazing job. You, yeah. you rock, babe. Cheryl from Brooklyn, New okay. York. She won a grand. Here we go. She's going to try to double her money in this bonus round. All right, Leah, okay, take it ready? away. Ready. Okay, here we go. Okay. okay, so one down. Here's the letter M. Prolific actress with 21 Oscar noms. First name? Is that a first name? Or first and yeah. last. Meryl. Yep. Yep. Meryl, Meryl Streep. She got it. Yep. Two down. Your letter is T. A preview of things to come. Trailer. Good. Good. In the movies. Good. Three across. Three across. D. Person calling the shots on set. Director. Yep. Yes. Good. Four across. Here's your letters. L O. And here's your clue. Partner in crime for Thelma. Please. Yes. yes. Four down, your letters, L-I, here's a clue. Thing for an actor to memorize. Line. What are actors memorize? Got it. Five across, J, a blockbuster with a lot of teeth. Oh, I think grab that, that one. Yes, and you know what we're gonna do, uh, Cheryl? What? Because we had to cut the time down just because of our segment planning. Oh. You got every single one right, so you are going to go home with a total of $1,500. Thanks to the Game Show Network. Yeah, and Leah, thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. Come oh, back I and see it. us soon, okay? It was my pleasure. Sorry I screwed all this you up. Did it. But you did, did a great job. Queen. All right, don't forget to love check out Leah and People Puzzler weeknights on Game Show Network. If there's one person we can always count on to lift our spirits, it's our friend Leah Remini. Her comedic timing was impeccable season after season in The King of Queens. Her star has shined along real life bestie, J-Lo in the rom-com second act. And more recently, Leah has been making the most of quarantine. She was just nominated for an Emmy. She's launched a new podcast and she has a new what? gig. She's done everything. You're depressing us. As the host of People Puzzler on the Game Show Network, Leah, we've missed you. What are you doing? being so busy stop <laughs> yeah right and you too and by the way i thought you were going to be at home jenna and ne like ne i didn't know this was like official today i came back like you were i came back because i heard you were going to be on the show <laughs> i love you <laughs> all right tell us man you got two you got so much going on how honestly how are you doing everything from home you've got your show you won your emmy you, or your emmy nomination you've got a new series and by the way, you guys, I, I didn't even know that we were eligible for an Emmy this year. So it was really a shock when I got like I got a, a text from a friend that said, by the way, do I look weird? I look like I'm leaning. Does it, no. am I, is my yeah, song weird? Good. I'm not technically. You look good. You look <laughs> real good. <laughs> it's always confusing it. which way to right. go, isn't it? Because it's like a mirror. Yeah, it's weird, and and I don't know like how to do the phone for this. Like I, last time I did it on my computer, but I look like I'm. Anyway, so we didn't even know. I didn't even know that we were eligible to be nominated for an Emmy. So I got a text from a friend that said congratulations, and this just shows you how much I listen. I was like, thanks. And she was like, are you excited? Like I didn't even go like, what do you mean? I was just like, I don't know. What you're talking about. I just thought she was like congratulating me for being alive, and I was like, acceptable, acceptable text. Um, and I was like, thanks, you too. And she was like, me too, what? And I was like, oh, what are you talking about? <laughs> you too. Um, you too. The last time you were here, you made us laugh so hard. Yeah, yeah. You said that one of the reasons, you were just happy to be here. Remember you put on that white suit? Yes, I remember the white suit. With you, no shoes, yeah. You, yeah. yeah. You're, first of all, but today I wore shoes for you, ladies. Whoa, careful. I don't want you to oh. see my <laughs> Uh, our director just yelled, yikes. yikes. So yikes. there's that. Why yikes? Well, well, because, because you were hoisting your leg up. They have a thing called yeah, but, spank alert around here, although yeah, it doesn't look I like. I held it. I held it. I held it. <laughs> he, didn't, he wasn't sure. 
<laughs> so are you getting on you your s sweatpants <laughs> more often now? <laughs> Oh, look at your nails. Are you out of your sweatpants more often? Or are you still still quarantining? No, no, I'm quarantining, but I have taken to putting makeup on just to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, and I put lashes on, and I've just been walking around the house in full, like, full <laughs> like hair and makeup. Full well, did you dress up for your Why 50th not? birthday when you had when you had your big party at your house? Yes, yeah, so, right. So I was supposed to have a party, and I kept putting, you know, making plans, and so this is what we're gonna have, and then. Um, uh, it, it was like, okay, you can only have like 10 people. And I was like, well, that's my family. So there's no point in that because I see them every Sunday for bagels and locks. So I was like, that's not, that's no. And then it was like 25. And then I was like, I can't, you know, I was looking at the list. I was like, what, what do I do? I tell them like, don't bring your wife. Don't bring your, like, so it's getting weird. And I was just, it was a big birthday, but I was like, you know, we, we just can't celebrate it in the way that, you know, yeah. I would want to celebrate it. But, you know, I have my family here. And uh, good enough. And really, my daughter turned 16, so she had a big birthday. My birthday's on June 15th, and hers on the 16th. Mm. And so really, when you have kids, it's really about, you yes. know, you, you don't matter as much anymore. And um, there she is, looking as Ooh. happy as can be. <laughs> the face most of the time. Wait, did I heard you had a special drive-by for her birthday, a drive-by parade. Is that true? Right. So at the end, of, so it, it was like a couple hours in, I started drinking pretty heavily <laughs> early on in the day. And um, uh, somebody said, come outside, you should go outside for a second. So I went outside and then Jen has, Jen, Jennifer drove by and she serenaded me and brought me my gifts. Aww. And my, isn't that so sweet? And she sang to me. She sang like five songs to me oh, from, from across the sing? car. What but I sing? refuse to not hug her because I know she's been great and I've been good. So I was, and I've been tested a thousand times. Um, I shouldn't say a thousand times because it's not easy to get that test, <laughs> no. by the way. But anyway, yeah. um, and it was a lovely, it was a lovely moment. I got to sing with my friend. Oh, well, that oh. was cool. She did that for your birthday. What did you do for hers for her birthday? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. You didn't. No, no, no. She's a huge cookie fan, so I sent her like ten dozen cookies. Ten oh. dozen. Uh, but they were like they were special. They had like they came with salt, and they were kind of like these gourmet chocolate mm. chip cookies. But it, I don't. I know what lot, you were trying to do but there. It's the thought. Yeah, yeah, we know. We know told exactly. Said, you told us that if she came out with not gaining fifteen pounds out large. of the quarantine, you said, yeah, you would be mad. I know what you were doing with those cookies, sending them to her. You have to try, you know, it's like <laughs> she refuses to gain any weight, you know, she, she, tw after that, after the appearance, right, she's like, send me, I heard that you were, you know, say whatever, send me the link. So I had to go and find the show and the moment she wanted it queued up to where I, because I work for her family, and I had to queue it up where I said what I said, and she was, and then she, I think she tweeted a picture she that did. day or the next day. She did. I'm like, back at it, let's get it. Like, You've been getting it. You've been getting it. You've been getting it, Jennifer. Well, we wish we could talk yeah. about all your other projects, because you've got that cool game show, but we're excited. People it's called Puzzler. People Puzzler. People are going to watch it. Yeah, the, the People Puzzler on the Game Network and the podcast. I hope that everybody I can mean, tune in. It's Fair Game Podcast. Fair game. Uh, Scientology Fair Game, and um, you can go to fairgamepodcast.com, mm -hmm. and we sure appreciate your love and support. Well, you we appreciate are the best, you. Leah. You're so fun. Thank you, Leah.
it does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. nice. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! All right, if there was ever a woman, ever a woman who's never at a loss for words, it is actress, mom, all around awesome person, Leah Remini. Aww. Yes, that is with Thank us today you. from home in California. She always keeps it real and honest, <laughs> and we're so happy that you're here with us today. Well, I don't know how real I'm keeping it today because I put lashes on, I got my hair clipped <laughs> in, because I was so excited to get up to do something, to talk to you ladies. So I put a suit on, because I was like, you know, I've been wearing my sweatpants, my pajama pants, my, like, you know, hair up in a bun. The whole, sometimes not even, like, bothering washing. I'm like, why, why? And today I was so excited, I got up. It was, of course, like, four in the morning here, right? But I'm like, I had coffee, I have a white linen suit on, I spilled it all over myself. I'm sitting here completely wet <laughs> this linen suit as you know when it gets water on it not great anymore <laughs> but i did try and i might have some stains here do you see no it? you can see it you look oh, like i can i can no. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. she Wait. knows we don't care Hold on, Leah. Oh, yeah. i have to ask you do you feel yeah. different now that you got up and got dressed and put yes. on makeup that make you feel better so much better. I mean, it, it like it's these little things that you take for granted, like having a job, mm -hmm. leaving the house, feeling good, putting lashes on. I mean, I, I you know, it's the like, it's not um, completely on right, <laughs> but I still feel a little better than yesterday. <laughs> so what? What? And that's has, how I get through. Uh, what, what has like a yesterday? But what's every day like for you? Give us a little rundown. I roll out of bed with good intentions. Today I'm gonna to start a diet because eventually we'll have to leave the house. And then um, that quickly um, dissipates. And I go, I think I need a cinnamon bun because that'll make things better. So I throw in a thing of cinnamon buns and I have coffee and I kind of shuffle. I, I've noticed I've done like the old lady shuffle where I shuffle around my house and my slippers and I'm like, yeah. Can I do something about that? Maybe I'll clean that. Maybe I won't. I don't. I really should deal with that. Well, let me go to the garage. I walk into my garage. I go I should clean out this shelf. Who needs fifty thousand of these? And then I just kind of look at it. I pull it out, and then I tell my husband, "You really should do something with that." Um, I get. I got out the leaf blower the other day because I thought that would be fun. that would be fun. So I took out the leaf blower, didn't realize it needed to be charged, so I was like, got depressed about that. And I was like, what's my husband doing that he couldn't plug in Char the charger to the leaf blower? Um, so then I decided, like, we should get divorced, and then I started making a list of all the things that he's doing that annoys me, like breathing. Wait, Leah. Have you guys noticed, have you guys noticed, get a turn, like, Hold up, have you noticed the, like, how super, like, sensitive your senses are right now? Like, about, it? like, I've never noticed how, like, loud he breathes. And I was like, you know what I'm saying? Like, little things like that. You're like, wow, you really breathe. You really breathe. He's like, I yeah, Leah, I'm sorry, exact, I'm breathing. Should I die? I Would you like me exactly. to die and stop breathing? What? Hoda, I said that exact thing. I said, I noticed Henry, like, makes these really loud breaths. And she was like, what? <laughs> so I was like. <laughs> you know what's so funny? It, it's so funny because Joel's so neat. Joel never has yeah. anything out of place. Now, right. if he ever, I'm a mess. Like, if you could see where I'm sitting, you'd be grossed out. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm mess. sitting in pile. So Joel left his toothbrush, like, over on the right. I'm like. What's it doing there? Like all of a sudden, I'm the police. I, I mean, he does nothing but clean up after me. And now I'm like, oh, he left his Wall Street Journal there. The one paper. I'm like, what is wrong with me? It's so 
funny, like, how you notice things you never noticed before. We've been married 20-something damn years. Hello and welcome to Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. I'm NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn. This week, we are shining a light on the wellness industry and evaluating diet programs and personal training certifications. Also, why increased workload for pharmacists has them concerned for patient safety. Just ahead. The diet industry is seeing a big summer boost as people try to lose those unwanted pandemic pounds. I gained about 100 pounds, which was like very upsetting to me. Quarantine has been a roller coaster ride for Sanaya Dubose, a high school junior from New York. It was like this is taking a turn for the worse. Um, I would just snack because I was bored. According to one study, Americans gained an average of half a pound every 10 days while in quarantine. That's roughly 20 pounds a year. As a result, the weight loss industry is seeing its own growth. Noom, which features customized health plans on its app, was downloaded nearly 4 million times in the U.S. in the past year. Metafast, offering a coaching and meal replacement plan called Optavia, projects its revenue will top $1.4 billion this year. That's nearly double what it made in 2019. Weight Watchers, now known as WW International, is reporting a 16% jump in digital subscribers from last year. Nationwide, from children to teens to the elderly, the disruption in routines meant a disruption in healthy habits. I think there's probably four main reasons why people are gaining weight. One is that stress can lead to weight gain. Um, people were not engaging in as much exercise. They may not have been eating healthy food. And I think one of the biggest drivers is that many people increased their alcohol consumption during the pandemic. Sanaya just started her first week using Noom. She hopes to reach her goal weight in time for her prom next year. I intend on having one of the best nights of my life. And good luck to her. She's on the right track. Well, Dr. Azar points out it is more important to think of a long-term health pattern than a short-term solution when you're undergoing uh, something like mm -hmm. this. I know how, it, you know, you get oh, kind of gung-ho and you just, yeah. I, yeah. I can't eat. Oh, so Don't look at me. I saw, you, I saw you at the pantry with the Doritos. I was there getting them myself. That actually happened. What you have to do is stop eventizing weekdays. Now the pandemic is hopefully coming out of it. So if you're like me, you didn't have to work. Your sister's in your bubble. Hey, come on over. It's Tuesday night. Yeah. Let's make steaks. My son lost a tooth. Make a cake. <laughs> stop making a party out of everything. Agreed. Let's have some cocktails, day yeah. drinking, all that yeah, stuff. Exactly. We have to start flexing back into normalcy. I, I have to start, not you, me. Yes. I mean, a hundred billion percent. But what if you are like, you're like, I'm over it. No more Zoom happy yeah. hours with my college yeah. friends. What do we do? It's true. It is about a reset. Our nutritionist we talked to said, really, <laughs> losing the pounds when it comes to weight control, it's 80% the food, 20% exercise. So choosing yeah. a program is important. Meal replacement programs tend to be effective because yeah. it's portion control, calorie control. You want to look at your budget. These things aren't free. And then finally, you're really looking at, you know, sustainability. Is this something that's going to put you on a track to develop good habits that you can then carry on? by yourself. Yeah, it's got to click in with you. Yes. Certain things like my sister likes one thing, I like something else, mm -hmm. but you have to find the one that's sustainable for you. Know thyself. Know that thyself. is so important, yeah. right, Hoda? Like the people who say, okay, I'm going to cut out carbs. Like that's not me. If you told me that, yeah. the first thing I do is inhale a bread bowl because yeah. right. I just couldn't do that. So, but some people like regimen. Tell me exactly what I'm going to mm -hmm. eat, three meals, yeah. two snacks. Other people want a broad array, a menu. So you need to know that. The one thing to be aware of is any program that wants you to get onto really expensive supplements right off the bat yeah. or, you know, um, diuretics, because you'll see that instant weight gain, but it's uh, weight loss, but it's water loss. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can't do it long term. You mentioned the cost. I mean, these, a lot of these programs are not cheap. So what should folks keep in mind with regards to, to a budget? And it's tricky to compare them side by side. So we went online. We also looked and called these programs. Some are giving you a price per day. Others mm. are giving you a price per month. So you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Mm. You also want to take a look at what's included. Are we talking about the food? Do you get a counselor or a dietitian that you can consult with? Will you get perks like recipes? So it's not just, you know, right. the bottom line cost. It's what do you get long term? Mm. All right. Good. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks. Yeah. Learned a lot. And Carson's uh, tips. That's yeah, Carson, right. I love that, your tips. Got to stop eventizing yeah. weekdays. Yeah, well, the alcohol does it. I mean, the alcohol, oh. think about that. The alcohol and the extra food. I mean, try that first maybe before you jump into a program. <laughs> exactly. Cut Thank that you. out. Getting into the gym to get in shape, one of the quickest ways you can see results is to work out with a personal trainer. Four, come on. There are nearly 300,000 fitness trainers in the U.S., 
but how do you know if your trainer actually knows anything about physical fitness? There is nobody to create a national standard for personal trainers in America. Editor-in-Chief of Men's Health Richard Dormant says a professional trainer should have serious credentials. And with various training certifications out there, the magazine took a deeper dive into how some of those credentials are barely worth the paper they're printed on. Give me a sense of the range of certifications and the knowledge level that you need. It's everything from a bachelor's degree and you know months of study and exam taking to Googling uh, the answers to a test in your home kitchen and having a certificate the next day. So I wanted to see what it takes for me to become a certified personal trainer, but I'm not gonna go to the gym or take any classes. I'm gonna do it right here at my desk with this online course. I found a number of online courses offering same-day personal training certificates for a price. I chose expertrating.com, which charges $69.99. Check out the course requirements, internet access, an email account, and familiarity with medical terminology and anatomy is a plus. Check, check, and check. First question, should insulin-dependent diabetes clients get a medical authorization before undertaking training? Well, it's a yes or no. I'm gonna guess, yes. How many calories does one gram of fat provide? Well, I don't know, but I'm gonna Google it. Google says nine. Some of these questions are tricky, but nothing Google can't handle. I passed my test with a score of 72. Ta-da, here it is. Vicki Wynn, certified personal trainer. Meet real personal trainer, Don Saladino. He has over 20 years of experience training some of Hollywood's biggest stars, like Ryan Reynolds, Scarlett Johansson, and Hugh Jackman. How does the average person know what's the difference between someone with just a piece of paper and someone who has actual experience? A every gym should have a bio on their trainer. I'd like to know about their experience, their certifications. They should know a fair level of anatomy. I'm not saying that they have to uh, graduate with a degree in anatomy and kinesiology, but they should understand movement quality. He says a good trainer will always start with an assessment. The training session should always start with a questionnaire. That trainer should be asking you, health history, was there any injuries, any illness in the family. So if they're just jumping you into a session or putting you on a bike and having you pedal without actually looking at your movement, I think that's a good sign that that coach is just trying to put you through a workout and not necessarily train you. Don shows me what a training awesome session should rescue. look like. Bring that left leg in line a little bit more. Guidance from someone who has more than yeah. a piece of paper. Good. Wow. Really so interesting. Did, yeah, thank you. We did reach out to the website where I got my certification in basically 30 minutes. We asked them multiple times for comment. They did not respond. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine why. You didn't even do that well on the test, right? No. High school me would be so embarrassed that I got a 72 out of 100, <laughs> and I could use Google the whole time. Right, but that's there's your so certification. True. You know, yes. you said something that's really interesting. There's a difference between somebody who's just going to, or he did, somebody who's just going to put you through some workout. Anybody can do that versus actually train you because it's not cheap. Exactly. It's not cheap, and different gyms have different certifications. You don't actually have to have any certificate to call yourself a fitness trainer, but there are some good ones, the gold standards, and we put up a, a little graphic to show you, but the certified strength and conditioning specialist, that's mm -hmm. sort of the gold standard, and there are other highly regarded credentials there. You can see them on your screen. So those are things to ask. It means that they need additional training, months of training, a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in some cases. That way, at least they have an understanding of right. the body. They didn't just go on the internet right. like I did and get one get of these. hurt. I mean, trying yeah. to push yourself and doing things your body can't do. That is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Dawn said, you know, no pain, no gain is a myth. It shouldn't be painful to work out. And if your trainer is having you do things that hurt you, that's a red flag. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. I We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. I Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything for traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Our Across America journey Here in Louisville, Orlando, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. 
Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. I joined Ellen on her set. What's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Shane Jaraminski has been a pharmacist for 14 years. Pharmacists are the bluest white collar workers in America. But he says in addition to filling prescriptions, checking drug interactions and counseling patients, pharmacists now also answer phones, do health screenings, work drive throughs and give shots, including now the COVID-19 vaccine. We have pharmacists working 14, 15 hour shifts. So many of them are afraid to even come forward because they know they can easily be replaced. He runs a Facebook page for those in the industry with more than 86,000 members. When I ask them, if you could get in front of a national audience and tell them what's wrong right now, almost everybody unanimously said understaffing and safety concerns. NBC News spoke with 31 retail pharmacists and technicians across 15 states. All say pressures to be profitable have resulted in harried working conditions that can potentially affect patient safety. Shane's wife, Marilyn, is a pharmacy manager at a retail chain. I've done 14 COVID vaccines since this morning. It's been a great first day. She began administering them in late February. I am the only pharmacist right now giving the vaccines. I have over 180 prescriptions that still need to be filled. All we do is we just get yelled at. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. What's your biggest concern about the COVID-19 vaccine coming to pharmacies like yours? Not having enough staff and it being administered properly. NBC News reached out to the two largest retail chains administering COVID vaccines. Both say patient safety is a priority. Walgreens tells NBC News it's focused on hiring thousands of additional team members, adding it also provides immunization certification courses. CVS says it's doing everything possible to support its 100,000 healthcare professionals working in pharmacies, telling NBC that in most stores, there is a completely separate team dedicated to administering the vaccines. A national survey found 91% of pharmacists at retail chains rated their workload as high or excessively high. But it's difficult to quantify how that impacts patient care because there's no national mandate on reporting medication errors to regulators. But pharmacists say even one error could mean life or death. Do you worry about putting your job on the line by speaking out? I feel like it's necessary because I have addressed so many concerns so many times and I feel like it just goes on deaf ears. And pharmacists are pushing for national reform. In the meantime, about a third of states now have rules limiting work hours and mandating safe staffing levels and meal breaks. But that means two thirds of states don't. The pandemic transformed nearly all aspects of our daily lives, including how we eat. Just ahead, we learn the creative ways restaurants pivoted to stay afloat. And with takeout meals seemingly more popular than ever, where does all that packaging go? Those answers and more coming up on Today All Day. Not going out last year meant a lot more deliveries. We ordered a lot more Uber Eats and DoorDash during the pandemic, and that means a lot of containers like these guys. Our recycle bin has never been as consistently full. I have amassed quite a collection. 2020 saw unprecedented demand for shipping and cardboard. Shippers delivered almost 20 billion parcels, up 30%. It's led to a dramatic increase in the amount of recycling we're dropping in these bins. But what happens once these items get picked up? To find out, I'm here in Morrisville, North Carolina at a recycling facility that takes in more than 300 tons of recycling every day. Chances are something you put in a recycling bin has ended up at a place like this. With me now is Brent Bell. He's the vice president for recycling at Waste Management. Okay. Consumers created a lot more waste during the pandemic from staying home. That's right, we saw about a 20% increase in cardboard boxes and about a 15% increase in plastic packaging. We head upstairs to the okay. sorting station, what Bell calls the front lines of the recycling process. Brent, what's happening up here? So they're taking all the materials that don't belong in paper, plastic, bottles, tin, aluminum, that's all going through these other chutes so the clean paper comes across this line. An important job because about one in five items that comes here can't be recycled and contaminates the mix. Garden hoses, propane tanks, batteries, stuff that's really dangerous. 
Once items get sorted, they're turned into these bales. We're looking at these big bales of cardboard and paper products. Where does this ultimately end up? A lot of our fiber material, the cardboard, goes to paper mills here in the U.S. There's some cardboard that's still exported to countries like Southeast Asia, Mexico, South America. What can I, as a consumer, do if I want to help the environment? First thing, recycle as much paper, bottles, cans, cardboard as you can. Make sure they're clean and dry. And then the second thing is actually support the brands that are using that material. We can't expect to just use things once and throw them away. Martin Bork is the executive director of the Ecology Center in Berkeley, California. They run the city's curbside recycling program. We asked him for a little recycling refresher. So Martin, I got my gloves on. Let's play a game right. I like to call, is it recyclable? Okay, you can start with that bag, is not recyclable. Not recyclable. That, it gums up all the machinery at the recycling plant. Item by item, the verdict came. This is a very common packing material. Is this yeah. recyclable? No. Paper towels. It's good in the compost bin. Pizza box. And this is how we found it in the recycling bin. If they're heavily contaminated with grease or food, should go in the compost or the garbage. Plastic bottle. In the blue bin. But if a bottle is fully covered in shrink wrap, remove the label before recycling. And that's a legislation thing, like we should be designing for recycling. Bork says laws can set a standard when it comes to package design, requiring companies to make it easier on us to recycle. Coffee cup with the lid on it. You know, there's great paper fiber in there, but they're typically coated with plastic on the inside. We don't want that in a recycling bin. What about this envelope? It gives you the arrow, which makes you think it's recyclable. But if you look closer, it says store drop off. Not in the recycling bin. This is some tissue paper. Sure. This plastic takeout container. It says eco packs on it, but there's a five in the triangle. Yeah, so that is not recyclable in most programs. All these things we found in the recycling bin, almost none of them are recyclable. And they're all things that you would think would be because they have a chasing arrow on them or they have a little label that says how to recycle. And then there was this. Looks like a, a Brita water filter. It's a great example of waste cycling. Somebody really wants that plastic to be recycled. This is trash. Yes. Bork says wish cycling is when someone wishes an item will be recycled because they put it in the bin. Most of the country are fighting contamination every day. As much as 30% of what they collect that ends up going to the landfill. A reminder that recycling starts with consumers making the right choices at home. Now, experts say legislation makes a big difference. For example, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act has been reintroduced in Congress. It calls for all companies to phase out certain single-use plastics that cannot be recycled. You know, this is not just on consumers. It's hard to do it all if these products are being mm -hmm. made and they're destined for the mm -hmm. landfill. And we talked about it. It's sort of confusing. Yeah. It is confusing. Habits can be hard to break. I think wish cycling, we've, yeah, all, we've all been, been guilty of that. that. You think, oh, well, hopefully they can recycle this. Yeah. Yeah. So what can you do if you really want to turn over a new leaf mm -hmm. and be better about it? Yeah, we hear a lot about the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. But really, you want to start with the fourth R, which is refuse. Mm. Just don't accept the waste in the first place. And for mm. example, it's refusing those plastic utensils or yeah. sauce packets. If you're getting food delivered to your home, you've got that at home already. Or you keep a reusable bottle or cup with you. A simple thing like reusing our coffee cups could literally save billions of cups a year. Billions. Yeah. And so I it's just it cutting it down in the first place. I cannot believe you said that people were trying to recycle bowling balls. Yes. I mean, they that's get, like, insane. thousands of bowling balls oh a gosh. year at waste management and car wow. batteries, too. So it's one of those, like, why would you well, think that's recycling? Yeah, let's not do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, I'm glad we're shining a light on this. Our Across America journey Here in Louisville, Louisville Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland. Reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. It does seem as if this White House doesn't want to bring a lot of high-profile attention to the issue. What efforts might depoliticize vaccine hesitancy? What happens if we don't act on police reform this year? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. 
I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Right now on NBC News Now. They've done things like installing cameras to help alert Border Patrol to people crossing. They are escaping a number of conditions there, of uh, violence and persecution in their home countries. Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. When the pandemic shut down restaurants across the country, 8 million workers lost their jobs overnight. The National Restaurant Association reports 110,000 restaurants closed for good. That's 17 percent of the nation's eateries. But a new lifeline, Ghost Kitchens, they're a delivery or pickup only restaurant that accepts call in or online orders. No dining room, no service staff, just cooks who make the meals. So how exactly do these ghost kitchens work? I'm here with Jamil Labou. He's the co-founder of Wing Champs. Jamil, tell me, how has this helped your business? Uh, it's been beautiful. Uh, it gives me the flexibility to still make it home to my kids. It takes the pressure off of running a physical location of, of my own right now. If people want to order Wing Champs, they can't go to a restaurant to do it. What do they do? Well, they order off our site online or they go to Uber Eats. Jamil used to sell his wings from a food truck, but permit fees, labor, and truck maintenance all added up. He says renting a ghost kitchen means having all the tools for restaurant quality food without the extra cost of a traditional restaurant. And when the coronavirus hit... Your business actually picked up during the pandemic? Yes. I, I skyrocketed, to be honest. Wow. And how's the food? Okay, so which one is my order? This is your order right here. Can't wait to try it. I'm going to take a step back so okay. I can try and take mm -hmm. off my mask. It looks amazing. Right. So good. <laughs> Wing Champs is one of 12 ghost kitchens operating out of the Garden State Kitchen in Orange, New Jersey, open 24-7. Co-founder Chris Olef says many are stirring up success in a second career. We are seeing many more people who are unemployed from losing their job in the restaurant business and for the first time having the time, energy and motivation to start a dream. And there's a community aspect to Ghost Kitchens too. One space like this in Orange, New Jersey can host multiple kitchens, which means for you, the diner, multiple food choices. That steak looks amazing. And here we have Indira Sturdevant. She's launching a new Latin fusion concept. What made you decide to go with this kitchen route? I would say overhead cost is very expensive on a brick and mortar restaurant. So it's actually, um, you know, a, a brand new way to facilitate those that don't have $500,000 to start a restaurant. Indira graduated from culinary school, but chose consulting for her career. She fed her craving for the kitchen by catering music festivals. With the COVID-19 crisis, she lost her job and the music stopped. And then I found out about this kitchen last year. So it, this is a brand new experience on all points for us. And so far? It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so can't wait to try it. Yes, Thank hope you, you like it. I'm gonna get one of those shrimp. So good. That's gonna be a big hit. Consumers win. Not only are new mom and pops opening up, but established chains like Chipotle, Wow Bao, and Famous Dave's can also open ghost kitchens to serve new neighborhoods. It means that the consumer has more choices and options than ever before. The National Restaurant Association says pre-pandemic, 5% of restaurant orders were digital. Now that's increased to 20%. Are ghost kitchens helping to save the restaurant industry? In this environment, yes, and over the longer term, they will be a mainstay. We'll never say goodbye to dining out, but technology, the pandemic, and demand for good food cooked up a kitchen concept here to stay. Wow. Yeah, and consider this. One in 10 working people in America work for a restaurant in the food industry, so it is vital to our economy. Two and a half million restaurant workers are still unemployed, but these ghost kitchens are helping to bring a small number of workers back, and many businesses have found success starting out this way, so 
It's a fantastic concept, great for startup businesses. And if you're wondering about safety, yeah. ghost kitchens are inspected just like restaurants are. So local health department inspectors go in to make sure the food is safe and that everything's up to code. I think it's a fantastic yeah. idea. You yeah. think of people you grew up with who were great cooks, right? Yes. And they didn't have a restaurant or what have you or the money to have that. But if you could have something like this, sure. the food speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, this is a great. way to build a following and people don't need to know that you're a brick and mortar restaurant. Yeah. They just order the food, they get it, they like it, and I then love maybe it. that transitions to a real restaurant. That's a great wow. Thank you, Vicki. I think that's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Opened our eyes. Yeah. Ghost Kitchens. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. Al is in Cleveland for our Reopening America series. This is the greatest location in the nation. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Our Across America journey here in Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky. Cleveland, reporting on an America rebuilding after the pandemic. How narrow of a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Tonight, the CDC's new outdoor mask guidelines. What change that allowed this new recommendation to be made? If we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? You're going to repeat this movie over and over again. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. In one word, what does it take to be a woman restaurateur? Guts. I think a sense of humor. Resilience. Flexibility. For these four women, the COVID crisis crippled their livelihoods. They struggled to keep their dining rooms open as restaurants shut down in cities across the country. Seven of the ten restaurants on my block are closed. Rohini Day, mother of two and owner of Vermilion Restaurant in Chicago, thought COVID might shatter 18 years of work she put into a restaurant. Four months was a complete abyss of trying to figure out, do I even want to be in this industry, given the safety issues, given the trauma to our staff, all laid off, trying our best to support them. But she took action, creating Let's Talk. What is Let's Talk? Let's Talk is an action-led movement of women business owners who own restaurants, and our goal is to help each other survive this crisis and to grow in the long term. What started as a small group of women restaurant owners in the Windy City now includes more than 350 female restaurant owners nationwide. I'm just blown away at what we've done in this small little time. I spoke with Rohini and Let's Talk members in Boston, Atlanta, and Oakland. How many of you at any point thought you might lose your restaurants? Everybody? It's just I never thought this could happen, where we would be in this type of position. And to be honest, I still am not out of the woods. I just keep moving forward and hoping for the best. During the pandemic, an estimated 110,000 restaurants closed for good. That's 17% of the nation's eateries. And according to the National Restaurant Association, some 2.4 million restaurant employees are still out of work. I had no idea if it was going to reopen again. May German and her husband Nelson had opened a new restaurant in Oakland just days before the pandemic hit. Hitting our one year anniversary, but our dining room has only been open for 14 days. We were really thrilled to join Let's Talk. For these women, Let's Talk serves as a resource and a sisterhood to share ideas for how to keep going. That learning from each other is such a core part of Let's Talk. So every call that we have, we walk away with 10 to 15 different ideas. We also tried everything under the sun. You know, we sold meal kits. We did virtual cooking demos and cocktail classes. How important is it to have other people that you can lean on? The restaurant industry for years has been male dominated. Um, so to be... You know, a woman in this industry, you're already coming in knowing that you're going to be fighting an uphill battle. The camaraderie that we have together has only helped to 
I think position us and make us stronger. For women like Deborah and Jen, this organization has been a lifeline. It was a new village for me and a village surrounded around women restaurateurs, which I have never had. We have cross color lines, diversity is everywhere, cultures from all over the world are, are in existence. Going to make sure each other gets out of this okay. sound? Mm, yes. Okay. You know what it means? It means it's time for May flowers, spring surprises. All right. This week, we're so excited because we are surprising Lisa Manns. Lisa's from Seymour, Indiana. She's a substitute teacher who was nominated by her friend Bridget Longmire. Okay. So in 2016, Lisa was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And when she arrived home after a chemo treatment, she would come home to find packages from her friends and family on her doorstep. Yeah, she was so touched that this is what she did. She started a nonprofit. It's called Warrior Bags, and she did it with a few of her closest friends. Listen how sweet this is. So they filled bags like this right mm -hmm. here with things that a cancer patient might need while going through treatment. Blankets, chemo bands, peppermint, tummy drops, lip balm, mm. inspirational messages, anything somebody would need to feel better. So, you know, Lisa's so cool to be sort of paying it forward. And in the last two years, she sent over 600 oh. of these personalized bags to cancer patients all over the country making sure that nobody fights alone. Oh, don't we love her? So today we're happy to report that Lisa's cancer-free. Let's call her. Oh Shall my gosh. Her? Yeah, she has no idea we're calling. All right, let's see. Let's ring it, ringy jingy. Okay, come on, Lisa. Lisa? 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 Hello? It's Hi, Hoda Lisa. and Jenna. How are you? <laughs> First of all, we just want to ask, is it okay if we record you right now? Is that all right? Because you're on live television. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so we want to let you know that your friend Bridget nominated you for our May Flowers Spring Surprises for all the hard work that you put into your nonprofit Warrior Bags. We actually have one of your Warrior Bags with us right now. We're so excited. <laughs> Lisa, are you surprised? I am very surprised. <laughs> oh, we love you, Lisa. We, well, ju we just want you to know that there's more. Yeah, there's a little bit more. We want to give you a second, but will you do us a favor and walk to your front door and take a peek outside? Oh, my. <laughs> Oh. I was supposed to be substitute teaching today, and they called and canceled me. <laughs> That's why they canceled. We had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my Lisa, Lisa. Okay. Now, Lisa's screaming because her friend Bridget is there who nominated her, her family. And by the way, you're also looking at co-founders of her organization, Mandy, Mary, and Joni. They came from oh all over God. the country. Oh Some drove God. for four hours yeah. and five hours. They hopped on planes to see you. Oh. <laughs> but but oh. by the way, okay, are you ready? One more thing. That's not all, Lisa. Bridget has a bouquet, okay? And it has okay. a spe special message just for you. So will you open it and open the card and read us the message? This is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> this is a donation for one of us. <laughs> okay, that's right. Lisa Coles is giving you a $5,000 donation for Warrior Bags so that oh you can keep gosh, spreading hope to you. those who are battling cancer. You're amazing, Lisa. <laughs> You are oh, amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We, we love you. We can't. Uh, we knew all your friends would drive there to see you. Your family's with you, and it's just a beautiful moment. So we just yeah. want to wish you all the best, and keep it up. Yeah, we love you, Lisa. Love you, Lisa. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much.
It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Our week-long journey begins here in Orlando, Louisville, Kentucky. In Cleveland. Our Across America journey reporting on an America rebuilding and reimagining a future after the pandemic. Breaking news tonight, the ceasefire in the Middle East after 11 days of deadly violence. Richard Engel is on the ground. Do you think there's a connection between policing and racism? How narrow a window do you have to really get kids back where we would want them to be? NBC Nike News with Lester Holt. A few weeks ago, I told you about my time at the 25th anniversary of Essence Festival held in New Orleans over the 4th of July weekend. More than half a million people go to talk about everything from fashion to politics. This year, I moderated a discussion with five mayors, all African-American women, and four of them are the first women, period, to hold the office of mayor in their cities. Here's a taste of that discussion now. Yeah, all right, I'm ready to chat. <laughs> Meet five mayors who don't just have a seat at the table where decisions are made about jobs, infrastructure, public safety, and more. They sit at the head. The women recently united on the Essence Festival stage to speak about their priorities while in office and the challenges of the job. Criminal justice reform is a huge topic in our city. Keisha Lance Bottoms, a fifth generation Atlanta native, began serving as the Georgia Capitol's 60th mayor last year. It's really uh, trying to engender hope, not just in government, but in the future of our community. In 2012, Karen Freeman Wilson of Gary, Indiana, became her hometown's first female leader. It is imperative that we focus on education in our city. Lovely Warren is in Rochester, New York. She's also the city's first female mayor, securing her second term in 2017. Then from Louisiana. Building a community of equity and inclusion and being very intentional about it takes up a lot of my time. There's Sharon Weston Broom, in 2017 sworn in as the first woman elected to lead Baton Rouge. The top, I would say infrastructure, sewer, water, drainage, transportation options. While Latoya Cantrell is in her second year as the first female mayor in New Orleans 300 year history. We have a big national election obviously come around the corner, but it all starts with local. How do you maintain engagement? I think the most important thing is for people to see a return on their investment. But just a reminder to people that elections matter. Yes. As we look at what we're facing in this country, and I know in Louisiana and in Georgia where women's rights are under yes. attack, it's because elections matter. I, I would say accessibility as well. So we have 15 minutes with the mayor. Anybody in the city can come in and talk to you for 15 minutes? Any city minutes? resident can come in. It's an opportunity for them to help, but for us to respond to their needs. Is there anything yeah. in anybody's city specifically as far as grassroots organizations, either you can start yeah. or and if, it, if it's effective? Certainly after 2016, with the killing of Alton Sterling, killing of police officers, then the Great Flood, we were a city that was in trauma. And so now we have connected to grassroots organizations throughout the city who are helping in the space of stress and trauma. And in Rochester, we have um, really connected with our faith community. We have clergy on patrol where our actual clergy go out with our police officers. And what are yes. they doing? They're knocking on doors and actually talking to our residents. They're praying for people if they need prayer. I initiated a mayor for a day program where I've chosen three young, young girls, one in middle school, two in high school, so that they can see themselves, you know, in who we are and the leadership that we provide. If we don't sit in these offices and create opportunities for folks who haven't had them before, then we're not doing what we were sent to do. Our conversation continued off stage. How do you tap into your power? What would you say? And I think the most important gift that we have as women is the power of intuition. And when we harness that, I think it's a game changer for our communities. What keeps you up at night? You've got major issues happening right. in the city of New Orleans. Well, that's what keeps me up at night, the 114-year-old pipes 
that can burst at any given time, making sure that there's clean water, accessibility to transportation so people can get to it from work. It's it's real. It's real life, the struggle. How many of you are, a show of hands, how many of you are a first in your position? It gives me chills just thinking about that. Is there pressure with that? Oh, of course there's a lot of pressure. You break it down a door and you want to leave it open so that someone is able to come behind you. And a final note on how mayors work on a local level may inspire leaders nationally. The federal government uh, has some major challenges, and so people look to mayors. They look to all of us to get the job done. We can't shut down, and we don't shut down. We, we drive the change, even in spite of the difficulties at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see something happen and see something different happen, particularly the scalability that's needed at the federal level, look to cities. And I think that in this election more than anyone, domestic issues will drive the agenda. All of the women recognize they won't be mayors forever, so they're doing what they can to leave their mark, if you will. And Gary, a new mayor, will take over in a few months. I think the takeaway here is beyond politics, mm -hmm. we just have to acknowledge, like I said, four of the five of those uh, women were the first female mayors elected mm -hmm. in their city's history. You know, one of the city's 300 years. <laughs> When I tell my story, I don't tell it for people to feel sad for me, but to see a strong person and for them to know that they could also be, you know, as strong. Shalom Black's story began as a young girl growing up in Nigeria. My mom had a restaurant where me and my siblings would basically help her out. I think the only days that we had off was Sunday, and that is when we go to church. My mom would cook a whole big pot and we all ate together. So that has always just been special, you know, to me. When she was nine years old, a mishap in the restaurant changed her life forever. I decided to go lay under one of the big tables. And my mom has a routine where when she's done frying for the night, she would take the big pan of hot oil and place it next to, you know, the table. And then out of nowhere, the big pan of hot oil literally just like fell on top of my younger sister and I. Shalom sustained third degree burns on more than 20 percent of her body. After four months in the hospital and another year recovering at home, she and her sister moved to the U.S. to receive better care. I was like, okay, cool, I can have a whole new start and probably have friends that would care for me and see me beyond my scars. But things didn't really change, it kind of got worse. She found comfort and inspiration online. I was just going on YouTube to watch music videos and then one day I just stumbled upon a makeup video and I was just amazed. Just picking on things that uh, people would do and then practice it on myself. So I decided like, you know what, let me give this a try. Hey guys. Hi. Shalom's makeup transformation videos went viral, not only for her artistry, but for her authenticity. In one 2018 post, Shalom recorded her crush taking off her makeup and wig, layer by layer. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> I have to give you a hug. <laughs> I decided I want to take that power back where I'm not hiding. It was very scary for me, but it felt great to this day when I meet a lot of people, that's the video that people say, this is what I found you from, this is why I'm subscribed to you. People are not just subscribed to me because I know how to do makeup, mostly because of how I made them feel. Today, Shalom has amassed more than 1.5 million subscribers on her YouTube channel. Remember to always be your own kind of beautiful. Shalom's main message, beauty and confidence come from within. I don't wake up every morning be so happy about having a scar, but I don't think I would take it back. I believe that everything happens for a reason, and this is the reason that it happened, and I am serving a purpose with it. So I, yeah, I don't think I would be the same Shalom. It's amazing. So inspiring to have as many followers as she does, yeah. you know, just to, to, to show that you are beautiful, That's and right. it comes from you the inside. So many different ways. Right now on NBC News Now. Here in Chicago, about 20,000 middle schoolers returning to school today. They also took advantage of existing vaccine distribution networks throughout Alaska. I joined.
join Ellen on her set, what's been a difficult year for her personally and for her show. Very few people go through such huge public humiliation. How can I be an example of strength and perseverance if I give up and run away? Killer Roll, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yep. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. We're going to do our part and get vaccinated live. A very special naturalization ceremony. This is a really inspiring group. Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Killer Role, the new podcast from Dateline. Subscribe now wherever you listen. Have you ever spotted someone walking down the street, admired their style and thought, how do they make themselves look so fashionable? I know. Well, that is exactly what happened with two friends from San Francisco. And that conversation led to a passion project and a book. It's called Chinatown Pretty, celebrating the fashionable seniors living in their neighborhood. Take a look. The Chinatown Pretty style is really this patchwork of contrast, a lot of pattern clashing and a big mix of colors. San Francisco-based photographer Andrea Lowe and writer Valerie Liu have always been awed by the eclectic styles of senior citizens in the city's Chinatown. We'd just look at each other and be like, did you see that? Where did they get these articles of clothing and accessories? And how did they, they compose these next level outfits? In 2014, after a dim sum date where they spent more time focusing on the fashionable elders than the food, the two friends started Chinatown Pretty, a project celebrating the street style of seniors living in the neighborhood. That's nice. With a Cantonese translator, the duo takes laps around the area and stop fashionable locals for a photo and an interview. And we'll just say, good morning, Joe-san and usually just compliment them on the thing that catched our eye. And from there, you know, we try to ask how their day's going and let the conversation evolve naturally. Jacket's good. Very warm, very good. And after seven years of doing gallery shows and articles for local magazines, Chinatown Pretty became a book featuring more than 100 senior citizens from six Chinatowns across North America. One person we met, was this woman in a magical alleyway called Ross Alley in San Francisco. And when we asked her to lift up her fleece pants, there are these pink socks that read, my favorite salad is mine, which is like the last thing you would expect on, on someone who's like in their 80s. I think that's a running theme throughout the outfits is um, the element of surprise and delight. Through fashion, Valerie and Andrea were able to connect and unlock countless stories. It's a demographic that doesn't get seen or heard a lot. And, you know, it's important to share their stories. A lot of them have immigrated, leaving their families behind, been through war, are refugees, the list goes on and on. And there's so much resilience that we can learn from them. One senior featured in the San Francisco chapter is 87-year-old Dorothy G.C. Kwok, who's also known as Polka Dot. She works as a tour guide and documentary film researcher, and in her free time, distributes food pantry deliveries to neighbors. I mix and match whatever is given to me to make outfits out of them that is comfortable for me. I don't follow any fashion. I have my own fashion. If I'm called Polka Dot, I should have at least one outfit. She was born and raised in Chinatown, and she has a lot of history there. It was very difficult because we were discriminated my father had died when I was 12 years old. With seven siblings, it became very difficult to survive. But I got married after the second year of college and decided to move. But I was determined to come back someday where my roots are. Dorothy was walking me through Chinatown and telling me stories of her childhood there or growing up. And I've learned so much from her. 
I was so proud and so surprised that people love it. The writing that Valerie has commentaries on really explains a lot about people and really gives a highlight that immigrants especially, they have a life that can be full. The first quarter of 2021 saw a 169% increase in anti-Asian hate crimes. It is Andrea and Valerie's hope that Chinatown Pretty can shine a light on the humanity, understanding, and joy that can occur when we stop and connect with one another. I think that Chinatown Pretty is one example of how we can perhaps change or expand the general public of who and what we are by revealing some of our personal stories that go with the fashion. We are living beings and that we are as human as anyone else. They're in their 80s and 90s and living their best urban lives. They're meeting with friends in the park. They're playing chess. They're watching opera. We go by Popo Hole, which is, damn grandma, you look good in Cantonese. Damn, Grandma, you look good. They do look that good. is awesome. Oh, God, I hope you guys check this out. Check out Chinatown Pretty. Harper's Bazaar, known for being first in fashion with a history spanning over 154 years, is being recognized for another first, the magazine's first black editor-in-chief, Samira Nasser. Welcome to Harper's Bazaar. Oh. So it's all on this floor? Yes, so this is the edit side. Okay. I grew up in the suburbs of Montreal, and for as long as I can remember, I've always been in love with fashion magazines. What was it about it for you that you loved? The fantasy, the escape, the possibility, the dream. I grew up in a very loving community, but no one really looked like me. My father's Lebanese, my mother's from Trinidad. They are both immigrants and my parents were divorced when I was very young. And so magazines were just a place where I could be transported to another world. That world would soon know her name, but her path to the top was far from typical. You went to NYU. Yes. What did you think you were going to do? I did my undergraduate degree in philosophy and I thought I'm going to go into biomedical ethics. Yes, I said it. I wanted to go into biomedical bi ethics. ethics. Yeah. Okay. But her journey took a turn. An internship at Mirabella magazine opened her eyes to a new world. Did you have a moment where you were enlightened and you thought, you know what, this is where I belong? I remember as an intern being asked to be on set at Mirabella, but to just see how everyone on set worked to create these images and, and the creative energy, it was exhilarating and thrilling and something that I wanted to lean into and follow. And that's exactly what she did, landing jobs at American Vogue, Allure, Elle, In Style, Vanity Fair, and then a phone call that changed her life. When did you know for sure that you'd be the next editor-in-chief? We were in lockdown. I was in Prospect Park with my son, and I got, a, I got the call. My son was like, Mama, get off the phone. And I was like, I need a minute. The journey in the fashion industry probably wasn't necessarily easy. No. Did you ever feel like a fish out of water? Did you ever feel out of place? Or did All you always? The time. Yes. I love this industry. This industry has afforded me a beautiful life, and I've traveled and I've grown and I've learned so much. But at the same time, there weren't a lot of people who looked like me when I was coming up. Now determined to use her experience and create space for others. We are at the intersection of high fashion and culture, but still there's so many stories to be told and there's, there's a level of humanity that we can bring to those stories. And to be able to create a space and to share our platform and our pages with individuals for them to tell their full stories and to be seen in the pages, much like I wanted to be seen when I was little, kind of goes back to that ideal. Have you ever thought about the girl who is like you all these years later, who she picks up your magazine and it's her escape, it's her time to dream? You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> I do. I think about not just little girls, I think about little boys. I think mm. about people. I think about individuals. And I hope they can lean into their dreams. You did that. Thank you. 
That's all I got. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs> I hope I can inspire people to dream big. So great. Well, like so many women, Samira stays busy as a single mom. Years ago, she made the decision to adopt a beautiful boy. And you heard her talk about that moment and how it was a surreal moment when she got the call about this big new job while she was at the park playing with her little boy all those years later. They celebrated together. It was like in that moment, everything kind of fell into place. So she wow. is. Wow. She is, isn't she wonderful? She is really inspiring. Oh, my Harper's, goodness. Harper's picked right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. right. Half of all U.S. adults now fully vaccinated. A huge lift is underway for one of the most celebrated cities in this country, Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. This is the greatest location in the nation. <laughs> We're having a baby. Wow. The big reveal is under the lid. <laughs> hey, now. Things are looking brighter, so we want to help you find the fun in 21. Music is back. Y'all were exactly what we needed. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Right now in the city of Los Angeles, it's estimated that nearly 60,000 people are living on the streets. There's one woman who is reaching out to the homeless community in a very unique way. She's sharing her talent for hair and makeup in an unexpected place. Right here with a car start, baby. On the streets of Los Angeles, Shirley Rains is on a one of a kind mission to help the homeless. I think it's 22 people in the line for hair color, baby. The founder of the nonprofit Beauty to the Streets travels every week to Skid Row. It's one of the poorest and often the most dangerous parts of Los Angeles. I feel like I have something to give. The streets that are very violent, the streets that nobody else wants to deal with, the streets that nobody wants to come to. She says her mission is simple, deliver meals, beauty services, and even showers to hundreds of homeless people in need. How's your week been, baby? The 52-year-old mother of six lost a child and suffered from grief and depression for years. I understand the pain that the people on Skid Row feel, even though they may not have buried a child, I understand the emotion of trauma. I understand the emotion of sorrow. She wanted to give something back to others who also struggle in life, so she started feeding the homeless in 2016. Let's wait for this one to dry. You want your eyebrows done? But all the women could talk about was her hair color and makeup. I'm a hood stylist. Yeah, when you learn on your own, that's not a hair stylist, but a hood stylist. Shirley's beauty skills are self-taught. You guys want a, a haircut that will give you a number? But that doesn't stop hundreds from lining up each week. I looked at her eyebrows and I said, I want some of those. <laughs> some of Miss Shirley's eyebrows. <laughs> you guys made my day, for real. Do you want a glitter stick for your eye? You can do it later if you want. It's a little glitter stick, it goes on top. Well, okay. thank God for you guys. Oh, you good. The trip to Skid Row actually starts the day before, 30 miles away in Shirley's tiny one-bedroom apartment. This is truly headquarters. Yes, this is where everything happens. Me these boxes. Volunteers load up their cars with hygiene bags, a portable salon, hot water, a shower, and catering for at least 300 people. We got um, turkey meatloaf for you guys. We got mashed potatoes and cheese and some vegetables. Real food. Some real food. Some real food. I've been up since 5:30 in the morning cooking it. Oh, it's yeah. cooked by me. I'm gonna eat it. Shirley's hot home cooked food feeds the body, but she says it's the basic salon services and hygiene that feed the soul. They're not mean, they're not bad, they're not worthless, they're not alcoholics, they're not drug addicts. They're broken, as I am broken. And we all show and display our broken emotions in different ways. And it's just that simple. It's not a complicated thing. Shirley and the Beauty to the Streets volunteers are guarded by the community organization Fighters for the World. When they hear us coming, when they see us coming, they know that they're going to be pampered. They're going to be taken care of. We're always here for them. It's a cool feeling. 
As crazy as it is, this is our day of peace. I know that right, sounds right. weird, as hectic as it is, and some of the stuff we have to deal with, but we're all street people, and so we're very familiar, and this is like calm to us. Yeah, it's right, like yes. our normal life. <laughs> right, right, right. It's a happy Saturday. It's a happy it's a Saturday. Great Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Just happened to be on Skid Row. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. For the last 25 years, Shirley has worked in medical billing, and she and her volunteers fund beauty to the streets using their own money. They also use donations from Shirley's followers on Instagram. So many people want to help God her. God bless Shirley. Yeah. I've been to you know Skid Row a couple of times. I did a piece out there last year. It's one of the great dreams in this, in this country. And the, the fact that it still exists in 2019 doesn't say anything about those broken people. It says a lot about who we are, I think. That's been that um, way for decades. As a, I know. Yeah. I know. So. We'll Thank right God back. for Shirley. Oh, hey there, you loyal Today All Day viewers. We see you, and we want to say thank you for spending Tuesday with us. Yeah, it means a lot to us. And welcome to Today in 30. It's our bite-sized mix of the very best from all four hours of our show. I like to say we watch all four hours so you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. First up, we are going to hear from President Biden ahead of his face-to-face -face with Vladimir Putin, how he's preparing for that high-stakes summit, and the warning he's sending to his Russian counterpart before they meet. Plus, it was a milestone morning here in 